Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Clapp. I'm Arlington's Conservation Administrator. The February 15th, 2024 meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023 uh, to extend the remote participation of public meetings until the 31st of March 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. I will put a link to all of the meeting materials in the chat right now. Chuck Taroni, our Conservation Commission Chair, shall facilitate tonight's meeting. Please note that, all, that there will be a comment period for each hearing, and each vote taken during this meeting will be conducted in our, via a roll call vote, and we will begin with a call of attendance. Uh, thank you, Ryan. So I'm, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, so I'm going to just go over the agenda. We have some correspondence, which I'll review, and then some discussion items. Uh, we're going to take a few things out of order tonight. And then we'll do the hearings. Um, we're going to take uh, 51 Birch Street out of order. And then, depending if they're here, we're going to do the amended order of conditions. Uh, but we just want to review on the mounding analysis and the issues that are around that from Mary Trudeau. And then our last item on the agenda will be Thorndike Place. Hopefully, by doing it that way, we'll leave a lot of room for discussion. And so it's important that we um, it's important that we try to be uh, uh, conscious of the time that we're spending on each each item for the commission and for the public. So with that, I'll take a roll call. And I'm wondering if Mike Gildas game is here. I don't see him. So I think he's on vacation this week. Okay, so Mike's yeah. not here. Nathaniel Stevens? Present. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> Susan Chapnick? Present. David White? I'm here. David Kaplan? I see I'm David. Present. Yeah. Present. present, yeah. And Brian uh, McBride? Here. And associate member... Uh, Sarah Alfaro Franco. I'm going to get that right one of these <laughs> That's days. That's all right. Yeah. I'm present. And uh, Eileen Coleman. I think I saw Eileen yeah, here. No, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Him on mute. Great. Um, so let's just get right into correspondence. And the chair um, is present. Oh, so <laughs> Chuck Taroni. Chuck Taroni, the chair is present. Um, so correspondence received uh, in between meetings, uh, GM uh, Hackens uh, at Edith Street, uh, flood photos, Edith Street and um, Edith Street area. Elaine Light at 53 Dorothy Road for uh, Thorndike Place. And that was also about the flooding. Brian Marino at Melrose Street, Thorndike Place uh, had some comments. And the Coalition to Save Mugar Woods had some correspondence. They sent uh, one and two, so two uh, correspondence from them. Lisa Friedman at 63 Mott Street, uh, continuing concerns about Thorndike Place flooding and the ALT, Arlington Land Trust letter to the Conservation Commission, and that was also about Thorndike Place. Now. We have correspondence for other um, committee uh, commission uh, agenda items, and that can be found uh, by reaching out to Ryan, but he's going to provide a link uh, to that right now. But specific correspondence for the Thorndike Place is available at a different link, and Ryan will put that in the chat at this moment. So that was a lot quicker than I had let people know. Uh, we were going to get there. So let's quickly, um, so I'm going to take things out of order, like I said at the beginning. And um, so I'm going to call on a notice of intent for uh, 51 Birch Street at this moment. And if Mike Novak can uh, be unmuted. Uh, so let me just, before you start talking, Mike, hold on a second. And um, <laughs> So this public hearing will be uh, will consider the notice of intent to demolish a single family house dwelling and construct a two family house um, at 51 Birch Street within the bordering vegetating uh, bordering land subject to flooding. And Ryan, uh, can you update us on this project uh, if anything has happened in between the two meetings? 
Uh, yes. So at our last meeting, we had a few outstanding items. Um, one was revised plans showing the revised flood storage uh, calculations. Um, we also requested a, a memorandum from the engineering division, which was just re uh, received today, as well as a revision to the stormwater report uh, requiring a note that there was no modeling in the uh, that was performed. Um, so we received all of those items. We did unfortunately just receive the engineering memo this afternoon, uh, late this afternoon. And the general highlight of it is um, Bill Copperthorne at the engineering division uh, does not recommend that the commission close the hearing this evening. Um, there are some outstanding items, which I'm uh, particularly uh, item number one in his memorandum. Uh, the total storage shown on the proposed porous paved drive detail on the plan and used in the hydraulic analysis in the report uh, does not appear to factor in the void space percentage of the wash stone. Please clarify or update to indicate the actual available storage space for stormwater in each driveway. Uh, so that is the most important uh, item that he had pointed out. There are a handful of other comments. Um, that being said, it does appear that uh, there are some outstanding materials that are needed uh, before the commission can close the hearing. Um, so I recommend the commission not close this, but I see we do have Rich Kirby uh, in the audience and he can speak to uh, Bill's memo if he has had the opportunity to review it. Sure, uh, Rich, are you on? Uh, so if you could uh, just introduce yourself for the record, if you are gonna be taking this up, but we do have a revised memo. And unfortunately, there's two issues. One, it has some action items that um, that appear need to be done and to be completed by the engineering department. And two, no one on the commission had time to review it. So um, with that, uh, either Mike or Rich, just introduce yourself and, and take this away and... Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, Mike Novak, Patriot Engineering. I too received this recently. Um, I was driving to my location that I'm at now, so I just had a, about 20 minutes before the meeting to really to really dig into it. Um, certainly, like you said, there's there's uh, there's clearly some action items here. Um, nothing I don't think that is um, anything that I can't revise and get back to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't have time to get it back to you before tonight. <laughs> um, and as you just said, you didn't have a chance to review it. Uh, I think we've, other than the, the drainage um, item, number one, I think everything that Mr. Clapp uh, re read out as we started, I think that has been addressed. Um, the plans that were submitted did have the revised storage area on it. Um, as Rich mentioned, the last time we changed the numbers, the plan just didn't reflect it. So that's done. And then I did add um, that no modeling was observed in the storm, excuse me, in the soil reports, uh, the logs on the, on the second detail sheet. Uh, those were the two biggest action items I had from our last meeting. And then along with, um, I think there's some details to try to address the last, the last comment letter from engineering. So, I mean, obviously, like I said, I, I, I didn't have a chance to see these or respond to them. So um, okay. uh, I, I guess I'll just leave it up to you, Mr. Chair, as to how to proceed because <laughs> we're kind of both in a, we're both at a disadvantage here. That's right. And I think uh, we're going to err in caution and I'm going to ask you uh, that we'd like to continue this hearing until, um, let's see, the 15th. So it would be next month. Right? Next meeting is on the 7th of on the uh, 7th. March. Wow. So we'd like to get a, a ask your permission to extend this to the 7th of March. I don't think there's a, much of a choice, so Great. <laughs> off we go. Commission, can I get a motion to extend uh, 51 Birch Street to the 7th of March? I'll make a motion to continue the hearing to March 7th. Can I have a second? I'll second. second. <laughs> I didn't make that call. So David White is, so David White second. Um, David, Cla uh, David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. And the chair says yes. Okay. 
sorry about that last minute notice, but uh, we'll see you on the 7th. Yeah, we'll do everything we can to get everything ahead of time as fast as we can. So hopefully we're not in this position again. Great. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along, we uh, have, um, let's see if we have Claire's here for, Claire Ricker is here, here. From, from the DPCD department of Arlington. And we're gonna discuss the Inland Wetland District and Claire's um, has permission to, I don't know if you have a presentation or you're just gonna talk, but, um, but uh, we're gonna talk about the Inland Wetland District and uh, we'll go from, there, so Claire, just uh, state your name and uh, position for the for the record, please. Sure, absolutely. My name is Claire Ricker. I'm the director of um, planning <clears throat> and community development here um, for the town of Arlington, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, a Warren article that has gone in front of um, that is uh, in front of the went in front of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, presented by uh, David Morgan on December 13th, and that is to delete um, section 5.8 from the um, zoning bylaw, which governs the inland wetland district. Um, and the reasons for this uh, removal is that the inland wetland district, um, the, the jurisdiction um, is superseded by the conservation um, commission. Um, the conservation um, Commission, you know, you all possess a robust authority to protect um, the wetlands via your public hearings, permit review, um, and acquisition. Um, the Inland Wetland District uh, is a redundant overlay um, that has created really un unnecessary complexity and potential for conflicting regulations. Um, the Inland Wetland District itself is internally inconsistent um, and is practically inapplicable in its current state. Um, the Inland Wetland District's kind of broad brush approach fails to differentiate between various wetland types, functions, and performance standards, and therefore um, fails to provide intended protections. Um, it, it's an impediment to development. Um, the town's permitting process um, could be uh, further streamlined by reviewing, by removing um, superfluous overlay. Um, a uh, more nuanced and data driven, driven approach like that taken on by the Conservation Commission um, is, prefer is uh, preferable. Um, the Inland Wetland District also references public data um, not currently included in the zoning map. Um, this is not necessarily a, a problem with the district itself, um, but not having that publicly uh, available accurate information um, you know, hinders uh, informed decision making. Um, and town employees, honestly, um, and uh, folks in DPCD um, should prioritize other work right now than going back and revising uh, the Inland Wetland District um, to make it um, more operational. Um, we feel that this district is, um, you know, firmly um, should uh, in the um, in the wheelhouse of the Conservation Commission. Um, section 5.8.3 of the zoning bylaw, which is the applicability, um, says that any proposed use um, in this district um, is determined by the building inspector um, and not and, and by the Zoning Board of Appeals um, and not by the Conservation Commission, which could leave us at uh, risk of um, competing um, decisions, um, frankly. And it just really muddies the waters, I think, in terms of um, what, uh, you know, the responsibilities of, of each, um, you know, permitting board are. Um, so that's basically it in a nutshell. I have shared um, most of a memo written by David Morgan um, before he left. Um, and I'm happy to try to answer um, any questions. I, as he's been on paternity leave, I've sort of been um, moonlighting as an environmental planner. Um, but that's really the, the sum and total um, we're looking to delete. Um, 5.8, the Inland Wetland District, um, given the redundancy and given the um, competing um, regulatory permitting boards um, that are involved. Um, this was a request that was made, um, you know, by DPCD, but also by the Zoning Board of Appeals and by the building um, commissioner himself um, that we um, sort of abandon um, this Inland Wetland and, you know, push all uh, requirements onto uh, CONCOM as is appropriate. Thank you, Claire. Um, so I could turn to the commission, but before I do, I'm going to just reiterate the fact that the zoning board 
DPCD, David Morgan, Claire Ricker have all, and I think that we've talked about this before. So we can discuss this or I will take a motion to accept uh, that we're abolishing or at least support um, the, the uh, town meeting warrant to abolish the Inland Wetland District. Hands for either commissions. I'll make a motion um, to support the Warren article to delete section 5.8, uh, the Inland Wetland District. I don't know if other commissioners need to see what that wording is. It was in, in your information. Um, I reviewed it carefully and I, I'm comfortable making that motion. Can have a second? I'll second it. David White seconds. Um, roll call vote. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Uh, David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Thank you all. Thanks, Claire. You're welcome. Thanks, Claire. Okay, moving right along. I'm going to do some discussion items right now. Um, and it's uh, Water Bodies Working Group, and they're going to talk about the uh, they're going to talk about the contract that they have with SWCA in partnership with Waters and Wetlands. David White, are you prepared to talk about this contract? Yes, we have a proposal from SWCA. Proposal. To, to manage Spy Pond for the coming year. The total amount is um, $41,550 within their budget. And we've been back and forth a number of times, but I think we have a good contract, good proposal now that we should approve and move forward with. May I add this this was reviewed by the Water Bodies Working Group and got their stamp of approval um, prior to bringing it to the commission um, for a vote. And, and that contract was in our materials as well, right? Yeah. Yes, it was. Thank you. So, so it looks like it's there any 41, questions, but yeah. 41505 right. what we're what the material is. Right. Which is within budget. Um, actually, it spans two years. It's fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. It covers it splits fiscal years, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's, it can be budgeted. I hope that collaboration between the two, WCA and Water and Wetlands, works in the town's benefit. This has been a tough road on our invasive, aquatic invasive, uh, you know, pathway here. So it looks like it's 41505, time and material, not to exceed and they have quoted rates. So it's pretty good uh, for the town. And those two companies are uh, who we've been using lately and they, they are, um, I guess, right at the top. So with that- it's Also the second year of a, like a two year contract agreement that we have with them. Right, and we made this contract a little uh, more specific so that we get things done in the time frames we want them. So in the contract, there are time frames for different tasks. It's for been a problem in the, in the past. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Sure. So any motions to I, accept? I move to accept oh. the proposal. I have a second. I'll second. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. So can I, can I make one statement? I just hope that um, just to Ryan, because he may not know the process. So now that we've approved this con this proposal, we need a contract. And Jennifer will help you get that through if you if you forward this to her and tell her that that it was voted unanimously to approve it. Thank you. Sorry, Chuck, I just want to make sure that's done. Good information. Yeah. No, thank you, Susan. So next on the agenda is um, item C, approve the use of the bylaw expense account for the Conservation Commission Administrator. 
I'm not sure how much explanation we need, but we have two expense accounts. One is from state fees, and that is called the Conservation Commission expense account. And the other one is from the bylaws, and that's the bylaw expense account. So we've been using the Conservation Commission expense account to pay uh, Ryan's salary and to offset David's salary. And it's, um, you know, with the David gone and, and the extra time that Ryan has been working, that uh, that account is either at zero or close to it. So we'd like to have the commission understand that we want to switch to a different account, which is the uh, bylaw expense account and uh, vote to allow uh, Ryan's salary to be paid out of the bylaw expense account. Uh, there's approximately $18,000 in it. So there's not, uh, there's no issues with uh, paying for, his, uh, you know, whatever else we pay for and along with his salary. So I think uh, if there's any questions, we'll take them now. But if there's uh, uh, just a motion, we can uh, move ahead with that. Also, move. I'll move. Oh, sorry, Brian has a question. Oh, just a quick question. That this won't put us in any kind of pickle as the fiscal year plays out till June. Uh, we don't anticipate any problems. Uh, not with the amount of money, and it, it's also um, the funds are set up in a way. The funds are set up in a way uh, when one runs low, it it can take from the other account anyways. So this is automatically happening. We're just taking a vote to uh, make it official with the Conservation Commission and for everything to be above board. So that's what we're doing. Gotcha. But it doesn't follow the fiscal year process. It's just a, it's a, it's a revolving account. Oh, uh, so okay. it's not the municipal budget. Gotcha. So we can't run out of money in May. Oh yeah, mm. good. You can only run out of money if we stop getting applications. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? <laughs> Any more comments or a motion? And we have actually, I think Nathaniel made a motion. And then uh, someone want to second that motion? I'll second it. Brian McBride seconded that. And so David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. I think I saw him shake his head. Yes. And the chair says yes. So that's that's all set. Okay. We have an enforcement order, item D, on our discussions for 66 and 66R Dudley Street. And we wanted to do a little housekeeping on that. I believe this is your item, Ryan. Can you explain yeah. why we need to work on this? Uh, yes. So the uh, property owners at 6666 R uh, Dudley Street, uh, they had a family emergency come up and they have not been able to get in touch with the condo, or at least they were not at the time able to get in touch with the uh, condo association. Our previous uh, iteration of this enforcement order required that they coordinate with the con the adjacent Millbrook condominium association uh by tonight by the 15th uh and then for them to have come back to the conservation commission with a plan of action on march 7th um the revi the revision to the enforcement order uh eliminates the had the requirement of having them be all coordinated with the uh, adjacent condo association by this meeting. It still holds the same deadline for uh, attending the March 7th meeting uh, to with a plan of action. So it doesn't really change any timeline. Uh, it just kind of, it flex, it gives them a little bit more flexibility uh, in getting in touch with the condo association. And I actually did get an email earlier today from uh, Evelyn LaRusso at 6666R uh, Dudley, and she did indicate that she has emailed the uh, the uh, condominium board, um, but hasn't received a response as of yet. Okay. Yeah, I reviewed this myself, and it looks like just in the uh, you know the what we've given them the, to do. You've just taken out uh, by February fifteenth, two thousand and twenty-four and just put in the word and so we just the same action items are needed we've just taken out the date and having them come back to the meeting 
to discuss that with the commission. So this is a situation where you're going to have to keep, you know, Ryan, keep uh, and David Kaplan, sure. You're going to have to keep an eye on this. David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can, it's it's been a while. Can you just refresh my memory why they need to coordinate with the condo association? Uh, some of the work that had been done was on land that was owned by the uh, condominium association. Uh, so they needed their sign off in order to do that work on their, their land. Thank you. Yeah, so they're they're along Mill Brook and the condo didn't realize they, they own the other side of Mill, Mill Brook and a substantial amount of the condo association's land has been altered for the purposes of a commercial business, so. And just quick update that um, Chuck and, and Ryan and a few people met with the condo association mm -hmm. on the site to kind of show them because they were totally unaware this was happening. Yeah, we didn't enter the site. We observed from the street. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Just since the, since the property owners of 6666 are, weren't, we, weren't, weren't, inv weren't available uh, just to you know make sure that we were doing everything above, above board. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions or motions on the floor? We're looking oh. to a motion to. Sorry, uh, um, I, would like, I was just going to say, could we just change that date from today's date to March seventh? I, I think if they're going to appear at the meeting, I'd still like to hold the feet to their fire to contact. I guess. Well, I guess they've gotten in touch, but you know, get some feedback from the condo association. So I guess I would I would vote to amend it to just change the rather than eliminate any date, just change the date, and we can change the date again if we need to next uh, on March seventh. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. The so the implication in having them attend the March seventh meeting is that they would have been in touch with the condominium association. Uh, but does it say that in the wording now? Maybe you should put it up the letter. It that does way. say it in the wording. It says. Okay. The property owner shall attend the March 7th, 2024 meeting of the Conservation Commission. What um, purposes? Remind us for what purpose. Uh, so the, uh, they need to contact Millbrook and to ensure that the stock uh, is maintained. I think it's the erosion control is maintained in good working condition. And, um, and they're going to need to talk to the uh, condo association. And, you know, I don't know if... It would be the only thing they need to do is contact them and and, um, okay. and then try to start working out how that's going to work. Yeah, why don't you put that up and we can discuss this a little bit. Sorry, could you enlarge it, please? I'm on a yes. smaller screen. Um, Thanks. How's that? Thanks. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so that, that last sentence there is... Um, you know, where the amendment is. So property owners shall attend the March 7th, uh, 2024 meeting of the Conservation Commission uh, for further discussion and to report on communications with Millbrook Condo Association. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm sorry. So we're, that, that's there or this is what you propose to add? This, this is, is proposed. Proposed. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, the, the original one, uh, I can pull that up too, but it just had an extra sentence in there that said uh, property owner shall uh, communicate with the Millbrook Condominium Association uh, by March 15th, uh, no, uh, February 15th. And oh, I see. The... Okay. I understand it better now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'll make a motion to move the, uh, to uh, approve the amended enforcement order. Thank okay. Uh, so do we, are we amend, are we approving it or are we ratifying it? I'm, I haven't issued it, so we would just be approving we're, it. We're, yeah. Okay. To approve right, it. So it wasn't anything just... that was, uh, you know, desperately, can I get a second on uh, the approval? Second. David Kaplan. Uh, Mike, uh, Brian McBride. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Everybody. Uh, David Kaplan. Yes. And the chair says yes. Okay. Moving on. We have uh, item E, which is the DEP 91-326, and that's our request for a permanent amendment for the Arlington um, DPW through a culvert project. But before we get into this, I just want to remind the commission, we are only, we're not really here to listen to the project. 
We need to know enough details to allow us to decide whether this should be a notice of intent or it's um, minor in nature and it can be an amended order of conditions. The purpose of the project hasn't changed. The scope of the project has not increased. The project still meets relevant standards um, of the regulations. The resource area is still protected and the potential for adverse impacts to the resource area values has not increased. And with that in mind, I'm going to bring up, hmm, it's a page, so it's Haley Page from Weston, Weston and Sampson. Haley, please Hello. introduce yourself for the record. Hello, my name is Haley Page from Weston and Sampson. I'm the environmental scientist who will be handling the environmental permitting for this effort. And I'm also joined by the project architect, David Stees, and also the project engineer, Elena Compter, just in case any questions might come up. Um, so I guess to start off, um, we do have a presentation prepared. However, due to the fact that this is kind of preliminary and getting the actual approval on whether an amendment is appropriate filing for this project, um, I guess I just wanted to first give a quick statement that the proposed project essentially is limited to the culvert that is locating running um, across the DPW facility located at 51 Grove Street. Um, it is proposed to install a, rein a glass reinforced plastic liner within the existing culvert to improve the um, carrying capacity of this culvert at this time. Yeah, a culvert assessment was performed, I believe, in 2020, as mentioned in our um, amendment request package we submitted. Um, and it was found that the this portion of the culvert from exiting the what was noted as building B on the plans that we submitted to where um, the property extends just before the high school to look to just repair by um, installing that liner in that area. Um, I guess to start just with that, if anyone has any questions or if you do want us to go ahead and proceed with this presentation or if it makes sense to just wait until the formal filing for this. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so we're, you know, unfortunately our regulations, we have to make this first determination and I'm trying not to have the presentation twice. Right. So I think that uh, we have a culvert at the DPW yard and the work is within the existing limit of work. It right. is um, the culvert that runs from, uh, you know, from, what is it, Mill Street? It's not Mill Street, it's Grove Street. Grove Street. Yes, to the high school. And in the, in the paperwork, uh, in the paperwork, you can see that the repairs are uh, significant and the Culvert has lost structural capacity. Uh, sections of the um, GRP, which is the glass reinforced plastic, um, is what they'll be bringing into the culvert. The work is within the previous proposed limit of work, and it's going to take about three weeks to do this work. Um, the work, the length of the work is about 204 linear feet of GRP will be installed, and during this process, they're going to bypass the water. Um, now, this is quite a big construction project, and we're talking about a culvert, culvert work now. And is the proposed work or the proposed project has that changed? Uh, is probably the first thing that comes to mind. But I'm going to take a question from Susan Chapnick because she has her hand up. And uh, of course, I haven't said no to the presentation, but again, I, I don't think I'd want to hear it twice. Susan, please. I agree that I don't want to hear it twice. However, it would be really helpful to me because this is a complex site. If you just had one overview um, yep. diagram or to show us a where plan this is. That I a plan sheet. Maybe we could start there. Yep. And I also have an aerial map that that can help kind of that would be orient helpful. where we're talking about. So exactly. Let Thank me you. know when you can see my screen. Um, I can. Perfect. So I think maybe to start, it may be helpful just to pull up an aerial image just to get an understanding. Um, so can make a quick Okay, so this is an aerial um, imagery from Google. Um, you can see growth. We're still seeing the diagram, I, I think, Haley. 
Hold on, let me try to share again. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. Too many screens. Okay, now let me know if you can see a aerial image. Yes. yes. Great, okay. So as I was saying, without pointing to the right image, um, you can see Grove Street is running right along here and the DPW facility is what looks to be partially under construction, which the work has begun for the DPW facility site improvements, but has not been completed yet. Um, so the mill drop currently runs across the site. Beginning in this area right here, there's a daylit portion of the culvert and then comes and runs underneath this building here becomes daylighted again at the exit of that building, then goes back underground, I believe. And then that's the daylight. It's easier to see in the plan sheet, but I believe that's the daylight. Yeah, that's And it comes back underground and is daylit again right before it opens up at the high school. Um, so now I'm gonna share the plan sheet just to have a bit of a better understanding of where we're actually proposing this culvert liner. So let me share that other screen now. And now you should see a plan sheet. Yes. Perfect. Oh, okay. can you make that any bigger, Haley? Yes. Thank let me you. zoom in here. I think that'll definitely. Awesome. Be Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So starting here, this is the area where I was speaking to where the Millbrook enters the site and it is daylit um, coming from Grove Street. It, run under, it runs under building B here is what is identified as the plan. And we're looking to install this culvert liner where the culvert exits building B and look to install the liner all the way till right before the ending of the culvert. So we believe it would stop right before the daylit areas. The only daylit area that impacts would take place on is this one that's located in the middle. Um, and that will remain daylit. The culvert lining that is proposed, well, there's an opening at the top, which if you look on the sheet that was included in that preliminary submission, it kind of gives some details on the different types of culvert lining that will be utilized in the fully closed culvert liner and then the daylighted culvert liner that will be utilized. Um, I guess you can see that it's a darker black where we're proposing that liner to be installed, cut off about right here. Um, I guess I'll pause right now for if there might be any questions on this plan view. What's the thickness of the liner? Um, I, Elena or David, might you know that level of detail? Yeah, I, I can answer that, Haley. Uh, it, it's about a half an inch. Uh, it's a composite. Uh, fiberglass reinforced liner, but the thicknesses just almost use as a finish uh, material to form what is in the interstitial space between the liner and the existing culvert walls gets pumped in and grouted solid. So although the liner itself might be thin, it makes a fully, and here you can see in the photo, it makes a fully reinforced and stabilized uh, culvert uh, walls and surround. Thank you, that's helpful. Sure. Is this the photo? Let's see. Um, is there any other questions right off the bat or additional details we can give? Do you know when the uh, permit, you, the permit hasn't expired, it's still in effect and you can finish up this project um, without needing an extension? That's what we believe. I believe that an extension was granted in 2023 through 2026. Um, so there should be no problem with completing this work prior to that, is my understanding at this time. And what are the what are the stream conditions that you're going to try to do this work in? Um, that's a great question. Elena and David, do you know what the kind of timeline they're looking to work in? Well, they want to try to achieve this when uh, the flow is at a reduced capacity. However, it varies quite a bit. The Millbrook is uh, not always predictable, which is what we're discussing and coordinating with the director and the um, and the contractor to do this work um, 
once they start and mobilize to do it as quickly as they can, because that is going to be the challenge, the control and um, uh, of the water and flow uh, during the work. That's right. I mean, there's a lot of these details we could get into in either the notice of intent or the amended order of conditions. I, I know that you're bypassing the stream and how are you avoiding scouring when it's re-entering that area? What is it re-entering into? All those things can come up. Uh, any other questions from the commission members? Oh, I think it needs to be said that these these sections are. It's not like um, it's not like jacking, uh, you know, a uh, the culvert or like a lining or anything like that. These sections are. And David, I'm going to let you answer the question uh, it, because I think they were like five feet long or something like that, maybe a little bit They're, more. Yeah, about that, eight feet. They're about eight feet. Yeah. And I was told they walk them in, but in the in the application that we got for tonight's meeting, it says they're going to uh, pull them in, pull them through. And um, But it seems like people would have to be in the culvert to properly support them and wedge them against the sides. So David Kaplan has his hand up, David. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm curious. This is sort of new to me. I'm curious what we base this decision on. I mean, it seems like there's economies of scale here. They have a mobilized crew. There's an existing order of conditions, but the proposed work doesn't seem to align with you know the the work that's going on on site. We're talking about in-stream culvert work versus a project that's basically just there. Uh, to protect erosion and sedimentation into Millbrook. So I'm just, I'm just curious uh, what if there's precedent, you know, to be able to move forward with an amended order, or if this, the nature of the project is so different, what's there that we're required to ask for a new notice of intent? Yeah, so it says in Section 18 of the regulations that the Conservation Commission shall determine whether the re, um, requested change warrants the filing of a notice of intent um or whether it's sufficiently minor to be considered an amendment to the original final order of conditions and it gives us some <clears throat> gives them some criteria to think about as we're pondering uh that question and it's uh first one is uh the, the purpose of the project has not changed the second is the scope of the project has not increased the project still meets the relevant standards of these regulations and the resource area are still protected. And lastly, the potential for adverse impacts to the resource area values will not be increased. And that's section 18 of our newest regulations um, approved in March 16, 2023. I, th I think David's comments are very good and your review, Chuck, uh, because originally I was thinking, oh, you know, an amended order, okay, it's just DPW, but it really is inconsistent with what was done before. It is an increase in scope working in Millbrook, um, even, you know, in, in the daylighted areas, and that was not part of the DPW project, the DPW yard project at all, so I'm kind of hesitant to say mm. it's minor enough to be an amendment whereas when i was thinking about this earlier i i was on board with that but i i don't know that i am right now so i often ask myself what would you gain what further protection would you gain from a notice of intent compared to an amended order of conditions because you can add conditions to it you just don't change the timeline Plus, it would be this, this original order is um, expiring in 2026. We'll have two on the site. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen. But again, to go through all that work, what, what, what are we gaining here in protection and review? Although respectfully, Chuck, I don't think that's the criteria in the regulations. I think you have a you know good pragmatic approach to you know, absolutely what you said, but <laughs> no, that's that's exactly why I said yeah. it. 
So yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and here, I'm just trying to look. So we cribbed off the DEP policy about what the amended what an amended order is, and I'm just trying to think because I think there's some examples in the DEP policy which I have up on my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, so yeah, under DP, um, the issuing authority shall consider such factors as whether the, the purpose of the project has changed, whether the scope of the project has increased, whether the project meets relevant performance standards, and whether the potential for adverse impacts uh, protect, uh, impact to protect the statutory interest will be increased. Yeah, that's, so we have identical. So here, let's see, I thought there's some examples. No, there aren't. I'm sorry. It's another policy has some examples. But I'm with Susan and I think David to to say that it's borderline, but it's it is actually they are assuming uh, my recollection is the same as Susan is that previously they they did not propose any work on bank or on uh, in land underwater or in the in the stream channel itself. So in fact, we are we do have additional resource areas. We're actually in those resource areas, not just in the riverfront area uh, resource area in the buffer zone. So my inclination is just to have them file a new notice of intent, which um, I, yeah, I, I think it would be a similar lift to what they'd be doing if they were doing an amended, an application for amended, an amended permit anyways, because that does require public notice, a butter notice and a hearing and all that stuff. So it's not, and it's the town, they're not gonna be paying a fee. So there's no argument there about, well, they've got to pay another filing fee. So I think it, it might be better to do it. That'd be my inclination. It's a close call, but I think my inclination is that it would be a new notice of intent. Yeah, so I, yeah, I know the, the way the regulations were written, that's, that's where it points you. But it, again, the pragmatic approach would say, why do we need to do that? And I still stand on that. Um, we're not getting anything else. It's being recorded. Uh, but we wrote these rules and we're supposed to follow them. And I think that's the reason why we're moving forward here. So um, with that, and I'll the fact that this has been 15 minutes, let's, uh, let's uh, more comments or motions. And uh, I think Nathaniel was ready to make a motion. I, I will just make one more comment very briefly that we are, increasing, as Nathaniel said, or changing the resource areas we're protecting. And that's, to me, a big reason to go with an NOI is because we're looking at land on the water, we're looking at bank. We weren't, those were not resource areas we were concerned with. In the yeah, but level. you saw the small openings that were, mm -hmm. so, and it's armored bank and it's a, it's a padded base. Right, so, and we'll have to divert. But those exist. It is land underwater, and even we'll though have it's to under concrete. It. Right, and how is that going to be done? And what if what does that going to have? I don't know. I I think I I think it needs to be a new one. Well, and 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 I'm curious too. I mean, if we're talking, like you said, you mentioned land underwater. Are there you know any kind of new standards for you know natural bottom culverts? Um, you know fish. I, I know it seems like the proposal is to kind of hermetically seal off the bottom portion, and I'm not entirely sure how naturalized the existing bottom of that culvert is. I know it's dark. I know it's a, you know, I, I'm not sure how valuable that habitat is, but you know, there seems to be under the proposal so to change to the nature of the bottom of that culvert. Okay. I'm going to ask again, can we get a motion? It sounds like the commission has made a decision, but I would just like to move it along if we can sure. get a motion. Sure, we'll, we'll try. Let's say I'll make a motion to uh, say that no, that a new notice of intent needs to be filed for this proposed work. I have a second? I'll second. Oh, that was David Kaplan? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Let's run a roll call vote. And uh, Susan Chapnick? Yes. David White? Oops, he stepped away. Uh, Brian McBride? Yes. Uh, uh, David Kaplan? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? 
Yes. The chair says yes. And David White's not here, so. Um, we have a majority anyways, right? Yeah, we have a majority, so let's just. OK. Um, before I run away, can I just ask one quick question with the understanding that this will be a new notice of intent? That means, you know, we need to recalculate impact numbers associated with this portion of the project. And the riverfront area on this site is associated only with the daylit areas. And through the existing open order of conditions, we did quantify impacts to riverfront area for the actual overall site improvements that will take place within. However, for this portion of the project, the only thing that would take place within the riverfront area would be being able to drive over to bring in the culvert lining into the actual culvert. I just want to confirm that that wouldn't be something that would fall under this new notice of intent, rather to just be quantified under that existing open order of conditions. Right. And assuming, maybe that's... assuming that you're, excuse me, assuming that you're driving over areas that are already marked as for sort of construction impact on exactly. the existing one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's fine. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be double counting. Exactly, and that's what I wanted to make sure I was avoiding. So that's it. Otherwise, we will get together our notice of intent and get it in as, as soon as possible. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Nathaniel, this is, uh, I wanted to add this one in because I know you're going to be leaving um, later on this evening, but uh, item F on the discussions are the unpermitted activity, um, which came up at our last meeting for 35 Beverly Road. And so it's, uh, there's a picture, I'm not sure Ryan has it prepared of the jet ski on the bank of the mystic and this area has been set up and it has a ramp to it um, some stone and a border and when we went there to look at the um the dock permit this came up and uh it wanted uh, the commission wanted to discuss it tonight specifically nathaniel stevens asked us to put it on the agenda so i see this as uh the commission deciding if this is a violation and how to move forward and then uh with that and the information we want to request, we'd send that letter or that enforcement letter or the uh, enforcement order to the applicant or to the homeowner and have them come back with the information and talk to the commission. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nathaniel because I'm sure even though I don't see his hand up, I just wanted him to start this off. Um, thanks, thanks it's your it's your baby yeah oh it's mine oh thanks yeah yeah i just for the record i did not put that there uh, <laughs> it's not that much of my baby no i i was just asking that we split off the enforcement discussion from the permitting so thank you for putting it on the agenda but yes i think the commission needs to decide as you say what if anything we want to do about this in my mind it is an un unpermitted installation of it looks like rails and a gravel bed, you know, on resource areas uh, that's that, uh, without a permit. So it's, you know, there's gravel there. There may have been digging to put that in to create the slope. And I don't know much more about how far those tracks go into the water, but I just think that it's not an activity that we should condone because would we want to see people around Spy Pond doing this or, or around Rest of Mystic Lake? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought is that it is it is an unpermitted activity. If they want to try to come, I don't know if the commission can decide if it should be order or removed, or they could come in and try to get our per after the fact permit for it. But I think it's definitely unpermitted work within our jurisdiction and we should address it. But we have to decide how we want to address it. Sure, I think that's the next step. Um... So we have a couple of a uh, couple of ways to address this. We could do um, it's administrative control. I didn't know what to call it, but I'm going to say something that the administrator would take on and work with the homeowner to make sure that this happens. We have a violation letter, uh, which we could put down some requirements, uh, some to dos, and then require uh, some check-ins and for the for the administrator or the commission to go back and and to verify uh, that things are have been corrected 
And then we have our enforcement order, which um, it, it requires them to uh, fix the bank. And um, so I know that Susan's talked to these, uh, the homeowner here, and she is going to recommend that um, maybe we don't need the enforcement order, which is fine. Uh, it's fine with me. I just want to see this fixed. But um, I think that we would first make sure that this is a violation and everyone agrees with it. And then the second step is the um, what we're going to use to uh, you know, make sure this gets fixed. And then lastly, the conditions that we're going to put on that and the time frames. So any... Sure. I might, sorry, I might just say, I think the, the before we decide what tool to use, I think we need to, after we come to agreement uh, on whether there's a violation, is then what do we want to do about it? And then we, and then I think then we might choose the, that will determine a bit what enforcement tool we want to utilize. Sure. Right. Do you see those as votes or I, no, I just no, I think, discussion. I think discussion. Yeah. yeah 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 sorry i meant to just discussion wise because I, I think but as you say i think i think you and i see it as a violation i don't know if others on the commission do as well maybe we're maybe we're in the minority mm. i do no i i agree yeah i see it as a violation as well i would like to just mention that i had some discussions with the owner and the owners are very um, environmentally conscious. They have a net zero house. I mean, they're really environmentally conscious. They they said they researched before they did this and they thought that it was acceptable because it's not a permanent structure. And, and when they read our regulations, so maybe our regulations need to be clear or we need some guidance documents on what you can and can't do on a bank. So that's something for the future for Ryan or David Morgan. Um, they thought if it's not a permanent structure, it's acceptable. And they thought that other neighbors of theirs that were putting in retaining walls and patios and things like that, those were not acceptable. So anyway, there's a big misunderstanding. I tried to relate to them why it's important not to change the bank and why that's protected, et cetera. So they are willing to do the right thing, which I just wanted to mention to the commission, so. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like we have uh, a violation and what do we want? Do we want the bank restored? Um, do you want the jet ski removed immediately? What's what's some of the requirements that the commission is thinking about for this situation? I, I would like to see the the, the jet ski and the pad removed and renaturalized, and you know we can leave it up to them to propose on how they want to do that. I imagine it was just lawn prior. So going back to the lawn would probably go back to pre-existing conditions, mm -hmm. um, but we could make suggestions on improving the resource area values of the no disturb zone and make some recommendations on how they replant it. But I think at the very least, it should just be you know, remove the, the jet ski and the, and the pad from the no disturb zone and renaturalize the area. Okay. It's still sounding like a violation and less so of a administrative control, um, more like an enforcement order and to me, but um, could be a violation letter. Does anyone uh, think this will work with a violation letter when we would just, um, I would like to just let them know that this is a violation We'd like them to come up with a restoration plan for this area and a plan to store their jet ski anywhere else but the bank. But I think I'd like to know where that is, such as they're getting that dock, they could they could tie it to the dock. And when it comes time that they're not using the jet ski anymore, they could just, you know, drive it over to the boat ramp and put it on their jet ski. Uh, tote and bring it over to the house and store it at the driveway for for the winter, but that 
that's kind of uh, how do we get there? And I think that it's not up to me to tell them how to do this. So that's why I'm saying that we would get a restoration plan. Yeah, I, I agree, Chuck. I like David Kaplan's uh, suggestion about what to do. I would just add that maybe like, going with what you just said, Chuck, is have them submit a restoration plan to us by a date certain. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable trying a notice of violation rather than an enforcement order. I think they've been co cooperative so far, and based on what Susan has reported, I think they will be cooperative. So I don't think we need to be as quote unquote heavy-handed with an enforcement order. And we can give them a deadline, and if they don't make, meet the deadline and don't have a reasonable excuse for not meeting the deadline, we can move to the next step of enforcement, which is an enforcement order. Okay, so um, how about uh, it's a violation notice? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Violation so, so notice. Can I can I just get a clarification? Um, and this is just a point of procedure that maybe I don't understand. We've had different letters sent to different people over the years. So for example, to the Arlington High School, we had a non-conformance letter. It wasn't not Arlington, Arlington Catholic for the for the turf field. It wasn't a violation letter. It was like one step below that, being nice about it. You know, we've noticed this. Can you please fix it? Then we have violation, you know, so that was notice of non-conformance or non-compliance. I don't remember how it was worded. Then we have notice of violation and then we have enforcement orders is are those under sounds like we have a really good writer on staff i but, i don't uh, know is there, you know. Is there any i don't know what the difference is between some of those i don't know i don't know yeah. i don't think there is i, okay. I think it's a difference between agents maybe as well oh, okay okay, yeah, okay. that's all i wanted to i will also just interject that the um homeowner is planning on submitting an rda to do restoration of the bank, to do some planting restoration, you know, right, some, Susan, we're 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 getting beyond the scope. No, I just want to. Mm -hmm. I just well, I thought it was relevant because you were talking because Dave Kaplan was talking about restoration. So I right. thought that, that I know that's happening, going. but it may not happen in the time frame that we want to understand this project. Okay. So I would suggest a violation notice. And for the con and for the applicant to return on March twenty first, two thousand and twenty four, uh, conservation meeting and present a restoration plan and um, and then to restore the bank and and uh, and how they're going to store the jet ski not only in the summer but in the winter time also, and if at that point there is um, there's some sort of uh, you know, new project they want to do, we could talk about combining both of them at that point. So it, I don't know if anyone wants to repeat that or you could just say, so moved. Um, so moved. I have a second. Second. I'm going to say that was Brian McBride. So yep. uh, David Kaplan. Yes. And David White. Yes. Susan Shapnick. Yes. And Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And I don't know where I'm at. Uh, sorry, who did I miss? Uh, da uh, David Kaplan, right? No, I said David. You already got me. It must have been Brian McBride. Uh, yes. Hey, and the chair says yes. So hopefully everyone's, if I miss someone, just let me know. Ryan, when you write that letter, could you just make sure we're very clear about the jurisdictional resource areas and what can and can't be done just because this applicant really didn't understand our regulations. Yeah, sure. Brian, why don't Thank we you. do this? Why don't you write the letter and then distribute it to me and Susan? We'll discuss it at one of our meetings. Perfect. Before exactly. we send it out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's go quickly. So the park and recs, this is mine. Park and rec, uh, they're, they're going to submit a project. Um, the recreation department update, uh, so the discussion was on February 15th. It's a second public meeting for the Mount Honorary Rocks playground and picnic area, which is gonna introduce new equipment outside the 50 foot buffer zone. Uh, and within that area with outside of the 50 foot, there's gonna be minimal grading, no trees cut. And um, they're gonna restore something within the resource, well, just outside the resource area, but within the uh, 50 foot uh, 
buffer zone. They're going to restore a previously disturbed area. So they're coming to the Conservation Commission for that project, and I think they need to be funded first. But we will see that, um, and we'll be able to talk about it. But it's um, it's it's a it's a, another playground project, and they really do a great job at their playgrounds. If anyone's seen some of their work lately, their next meeting is February. 27th, 2024, and Nathaniel, Susan, and myself have been sharing the duties. I went to the last one. Is anyone available to go to this one on the 27th? Uh, sorry, I know I'm due, but I, I can't. I'm actually, um, I think I'm out of town or returning from being out of town, so I don't want to uh, trust the airlines to get me there on time. Susan, are you available or... I could go again too if it's if well, it's conflict. Kind of. So the art the artificial turf committee, which which I've been just sitting in on, is meeting that night for probably two hours instead of one hour, which might conflict. Um, I'd love to attend that meeting because I'm missing the next one. Yeah, but so I think you can't go Chuck. About... You know, I could. Yeah, so I think there was some discussion with um, uh, the committee members that also attended the turf committee and also attended uh, the recreation, and they said that that's going to be a conflict. And since Joe Connolly and oh right, Leslie, yeah, yeah. Leslie, yeah, so so they might it, it might the it might solve itself. It might solve itself. If you go, great. Yeah. If it turns into a conflict, I'll step in. Okay? okay, that sounds good. So you can put me there, and then if it doesn't okay. work we can have thank you I, I i owe you guys one and also i guess the other thing too is if there's nothing on the park and rec agenda too that you think's of concern but right. that's kind of hard to, it's hard to tell because stuff comes up more right than, you know. i see eileen has her hand up thank you susan sorry i didn't know uh, if she's there. a lot of people <laughs> on eileen do you have something to say about uh the park and rec i was meeting? just going to offer myself as a backup um since i, I didn't but I, when i put up my hand i wasn't sure who's was available uh, thank you. I think this one we have solved, but um, uh, maybe in the future or for other committee meetings, that would be great to to bring your hand up. Um, next on the agenda, item H. Oh, we... Just quick, quick note: uh, the CPA committee did fund the Monogamy Rocks. You had mentioned you weren't sure if it was funded. It did get funded. Got funded. Was that recently? Last week. Okay. There you go. Recommendation. Was it was it four or five hundred thousand or something like that? Something like that. I think yeah, I can't remember around that. Okay. It was it was it was there. It was like at that number. Well, that's great to know. And I think that uh it's good to move forward with that project. So next on the agenda of the discussion, I just want to do these quickly because we're really getting crunched here. The artificial turf. Um Mike's not here. Susan, I know you're gonna have something to say, no. but Wait. but no. So, well, no, go ahead, but but keep it brief because Mike is, uh, you know, he's not here and we need the time. Right. The Artificial Turf um, Study Committee had two um, presenters. Um, one was Samantha Jones, who's the head athletic trainer at Arlington High School. And she spoke about natural grass fields versus um, turf, artificial turf fields in Arlington and um, injuries. And she was questioned about that and also talked about heat. And then there was another speaker who was Dr. Helen Poynton from, she's a professor at UMass Boston. She's a professor of ecotoxicology, um, looking at toxic effects of metals and emerging contaminants on aquatic organisms. And she presented on the potential um, toxic effects of um, chemicals as well as microplastics and plasticizers in the artificial turf fields. And then it answered a lot of questions about that, also talking a little bit about um, climate change impacts. So people that are interested in that, um, uh, Natasha Waden does a really good job of doing the meeting minutes. Um, and all the materials are, are up on the website. How was that, Chuck? That was pretty good. All right. So um, I I do have a question. Are they, uh, so all that stuff, like 
are those recorded, those meetings, and are those recorded meetings on their website, or is that not what they're doing? I don't know if they're recording. I don't think they're recording. Okay. Well, they missed out because I was yeah. at that meeting too, and that was yeah. that was really powerful. I thought well, it was really good. But but all the materials, so so the um, Dr. Poynton's um, presentation slides, materials, yeah. Are, are on the, the website, but I agree with you. Um, I think they decided at the beginning that they weren't going to do recording. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, Sarah Alfaro Franco uh, has a tree committee report. And I will make it brief. <laughs> so I attended a tree committee meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, the tree warden, um just uh discussed how many engineers are going to be doing a uh, tree scope work and uh um that a new um stump grinder will be purchased this fiscal year uh discussed was the tree canopy program the goal is to uh, drum up tree requests uh the tree committee uh submitted a warrant article um, and the goal is to plant shade trees in parking spaces, in parking lots that are greater than 25 parking spaces. And the next meeting will be March 13th. That's great. Any questions for Sarah? Seeing none, uh, moving right along. So the next thing, on, the last thing on our agenda is that, um, so sitting at town hall is the ESCO agreement for 34 uh, Dudley. Uh, it needs the signatures before town council reviews it. So those who haven't signed that could uh, go to the annex and with David Morgan's offices and please sign that. And if we could get that done within the next week, that would be great. Um, we just need we'll, one more. Okay, so whoever that person is, uh, if they could get down to town hall, that would be great. I, well, just more one more to have a have a majority, which should be all oh, the. Jeez, we have three signatures at, <laughs> currently. Okay, but we should only need four. Okay, so whoever gets down there first, put a big candy bar on top of it. That's yours. Okay, <laughs> so uh, we'll guess go from there. Okay, so. That's it for the discussion item. I'm sorry it took so long, but um, that's one of the things. So I'm going to take uh, another agenda item out of order tonight. So I'm going to call 88 Coolidge uh, to speak right now. I know that Mary, uh, Mary Trudeau is here. And uh, Mary, I'm just going to set it up by saying we're just wondering about this mounding analysis. I know you submitted a report on some other issues. But uh, we can do that later after you've uh, made a request to the commission, if that's what you're going to do, or discuss the mounting analysis and the, and the issues that surround that. So can you just introduce yourself for the, for the record, please? Sure. My name is Mary Trudeau, and I'm representing the applicant in the request for an amendment to the order of conditions for 88 Coolidge Road. Um, as you know, we've been working on the third party review with Novus Engineering, who the commission selected to do this reporting. And we've gone back and forth a couple of times. Our most recent response from Novus was a December 15th letter. Um, most of the items in this letter, there were six categories that were broken out. Novus has either agreed with us or has accepted the information that was submitted to date. They did make some red line comments on our site plan. Our site plan showed the perimeter drain and drain system that allowed for water to move beneath the foundation atop the existing bedrock surface of the lot. Um, when our engineering team looked at this plan that was marked up, they said the, the only way to answer these questions was through a mounding analysis. Um, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, the software that has been developed for the use in running mounding analysis is, was not designed for this type of project. We're, we're a single family house lot sitting on ledge with a significant gradient. 
the software wasn't really built for that. The software was built for um, like infiltration systems or septic systems that would have some type of vertical separation from groundwater. And you would be concerned that you'd be pushing too much water into a system and having groundwater contact with your water that you were treating. That's, that's not the issue on this lab. Um, so we've spoken with many hydrogeologists, and I just wanted to read to you the response from our own Matt Hodges um, when he saw the plan request, because I think it does clarify some of the issues that we've been hearing from other consultants. I mean, we've, we've spoken with the list that you gave us, that, that Bill Copperthorne gave us. We've looked at our own. We've probably spoken with a dozen hydrogeologists and for one reason or another, um, they're all singing a similar song about why they have no interest in doing this job. Okay, so this is a comment from Matt Hodges when he reviewed the original Novus letter. Um, ONEP has excavated multiple test pits throughout the property. Groundwater, i.e. measurable and persistent water, was not encountered in any of the test pits. Evidence of modeling was observed only in the first few inches of overburden directly above the ledge, i.e. the bedrock. The limited modeling steep slope of the ground surface and the bedrock outcroppings are indicative of a situation where precipitation infiltrates into the overburden and flows along the surface of the bedrock. This water most likely daylights at some point downhill and becomes surface water runoff from the site. To the extent that an existing groundwater elevation could be established at the site, that elevation would be beneath the surface of the bedrock. And that's kind of a key point. Okay, his last, he goes on to say, stormwater structures, um, stormwater temporarily stored in subsurface structures will not change the groundwater elevation because that stormwater will never be in contact with groundwater. The thin layer of modeling above the bedrock is evidence that the bedrock is impermeable relative to the overburden. Mounding of the stormwater will likely occur while the water exfiltrates from the storage structure. The duration of that exfiltration will be on the order of days and will necessarily be followed by periods of no exfiltration, i.e. periods when it's not raining. The intermittent nature of the mounding and the permeability of the soils and fills will not create a situation where the hydraulic gradient is sufficient to push the stormwater into the bedrock. Therefore, we conclude that the proposed stormwater storage of stormwater, the, the proposed, I'm sorry. Therefore, we conclude that the proposed subsurface storage of stormwater will not change the groundwater elevation at the site. Um, and, and that's basically the response that we got from the other hydrogeologists. They just said that this site, it's not an appropriate measure and that they don't have the capability to run this type of thing. Uh, so what we would like to propose to you is that we submit our responses to whatever questions our team has been able to answer on the Novus letter, which is basically all of them, and address the comments on the site plan as best we can with the engineering team that we have in place. Um, we're not planning on submitting a mounting report because we literally can't find anyone to take the task. So are you requesting that we waive that requirement? Well, I'm requesting that you will let it, you let us submit what we feel is a complete response and let Novus address it. That most of the people that we spoke with felt that Novus um, would accept an answer that said this is not an appropriate question for this particular site because. Do you, Mary, do you have uh, does this applicant have a stormwater management report with uh, stormwater calculations? Uh, and and if not, could that be provided and and um, and also sent to Novus to to review? Um, I believe we probably do from the original original filing. I wasn't the wetlands consultant, but I can look back and have Al Gala pull that together. Um, okay, that would likely answer some of. You know, it's a really unique site that we don't get runoff from above because of the way the roadway is graded and roadway bedding being in place. We have a ledge site. We, we basically handle water that comes right directly from precipitation heat hitting the property. Groundwater is not an issue. Okay. Um, commission, any questions? Nathaniel Stevens. 
Just a comment. I think uh, I endorse Mary's approach. I think they should submit what they have. We should have Novus review it and respond, you know, respond in writing to it. And then we can go from there. Sure. Would that include the stormwater management report? I think if they have, are you, I'm trying to remember if they have, I don't remember if they prepared one. It's been so long, but yes, if certainly if they have one, certainly provide it. I guess, do we want to require them to do one if they don't have one? I guess if, if you're asking for it. It's, Let me see what we have before yeah. we um, get into that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just, a, that's a really an additional item. I did have. talk to Jim Vernon about this and that's, uh, that is something that he suggested. So our peer reviewer believes that it's important. Um, but if you have it, it's great. If you don't have it, maybe you have to come back to the commission. But um, so we have Nathaniel Stevens saying, submit what they uh, have to Nobis. Uh, I'd like to add the stormwater management report and into that. And um, what do what do others say? Any other hands? Chuck, can I just add to that? What I guess it might be helpful to understand, to get from Jim Vernon, who's our peer review consultant, what aspects of, of the stormwater report he would like, because I think that a traditional stormwater management report, you know, going over all 10 of the stormwater management standards might not be pertinent to what Jim is trying to get at. That, I don't think that's what he's asking for. I suspect he's asking for the background information that allowed us to design the system that we yeah, have proposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the cal the, the, the hydrocad calcs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Right. So I just that, that's my point. We you're, you're, you definitely have that that information. So yeah. that should be easy. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? I think Nathaniel's set. Okay, uh, I don't think this needs a vote. I think we just need to agree to it. Does do you want to vote? Well, we need to vote to continue the hearing, right? Yes, please. Yeah. And Mary, then how long you need? Sorry, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, I would like I to request that the commission continue the public hearing until the next meeting of the commission, and we will submit information to you prior to that meeting to allow you and your third party reviewer to inspect it. Okay. So I make a motion to continue to March seventh. I'll second. So, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that I understand this. So, you're going to come back to the next meeting, or you're just keeping, um, you're just kind of tagging that meeting. But if our reviewer doesn't have enough time, you would continue again. Of course, I, we will try and get you something within the next week. We have our answers prepared. I've just got to collate them. Um, okay. You know, if Novus can turn it around, that's awesome. If not, we'll bug them. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and let me go through the. Let me go through the. I'm going to say Mike Gill's game. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And David White. Yes. And David Kaplan. Yes. And Brian McBride. Yes. And Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Good night now. Good night. Good night. Okay, finally. Here we are at um, Thorndike. The Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act only to consider notice of intent for construction of Thorndike Place, multifamily development on Dorothy Road in Arlington. This hearing will be limited to discussion about uh, regarding a stormwater peer review. And with that, uh, my screen is blocked. Excuse me, so again. Oh, and uh, David White will recuse himself from this uh, discussion. And with that, uh, Hatch, I did see Duke here before. And so. I see Ross Mullen. Ross is here. So, okay, so let's go with Ross. Ross, uh, why don't you update the commission on your reply and please introduce yourself uh, for the record. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Ross Mullen. I work at Hatch, and I completed a third part. We completed a third party review of the Thorndike Place uh, development on Dorothy Road. And just as a recap, it's a six town home and one four story senior living complex on a 17.7 .7 acre parcel. Um, you might remember from two weeks ago, I had expressed some concerns um, in the third party review regarding uh, groundwater levels, um, as well as surface water intrusion possibilities. And I was concerned on both from both the flood perspective as well as the water quality perspective and the ability to meet standard four, three and four um, for groundwater recharge and uh, total suspended solids. Um, in the, in the, in, since we spoke two weeks ago, Chuck, Ty Mr. Ty Tyrone facilitated a technical discussion between the applicants and Hatch back on February 6th. I think we came a long way in that discussion to understanding some of the um, uh, questions I had around the third party review, especially relating to the groundwater levels. Um, uh, we, in, in the intervening week or week and a half, uh, there was the comments and response to comments that were sent back and forth between the applicants and I. Um, and, and I think those resolved many of the remaining questions. This morning, I did send out a, a summary level uh, list of what I believe are, we believe are the open items um, that, that still need to be addressed so that the project is compli in compliance with uh, the Mass Stormwater Handbook criteria. Uh, there were four things listed on that um, document. And, and I, I briefly think I heard from the applicant that, that some of, he was amenable to some of the changes. Um, those, those four remaining items would be the permanent establishment of vegetation on the south side of the senior living complex prior to that uh, runoff from, from the senior living complex being routed over the top of it so that it didn't pick up any um, sediment and discharge into the wetland. I'd like the applicant to verify that they provide at least 10 feet of separation between the infiltration, oh, la 10 feet of lateral separation between the infiltration tanks and the townhome units um, as required by standard three. Um, jumping down in my list of comments to number four, uh, there was some discussion about making sure the applicant manages uh, loose grit from asphalt shingles, if that's the direction they choose to go. Um, and then finally, and I think the biggest item still on my list is I'd, I'd like to see a bit more technical, the Hatch team would like to see a little bit more technical basis for the groundwater, groundwater mounding analysis underneath the largest um, infiltration device that's used to capture much of the runoff from the site. Um, there's they're, de they're showing about four tenths of a foot of mounding. And I, I get, allude to this below, this site is just walking an extremely fine line with the groundwater levels and the elevation of all of the relevant structures um, and, and making sure that the, the clearances that are required and that within that very tight margin of error, um, everything is, is solid. We've got a belt and suspenders, dot the I's, cross the T's. Um, that though, those four items are, are I think, the, the remaining concerns that the Hatch team has for the project. Um, and But I did just summarize this, this whole discussion this morning, and I, I don't know if the applicant has had time to review them. Uh, is that uh, the conclusion of your comments? That's the conclusion, yes, sir. Sure. Uh, Dominic Rinaldi, uh, I'd like you to uh, reply before I go to the commission, and then we'll let the commission ask each one of you uh, questions as uh, as this uh, they go through their notes. So please just introduce yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group, uh, the senior civil engineer on the project. Um, and let me apologize my voice makes the in and out in advance. I was sick last week and it's still kind of coming back. So if it cracks during the meeting, that's uh, that's what it is. Um, so as, as Ross mentioned, we didn't um, haven't actually technically received this letter. Um, we, we did manage to see it attached to the uh, the agenda tonight. Um, and we, we did start looking at it this afternoon. 
Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, some of these things we can re respond to relatively easily and some of them, you know, um, with a little more discussion. Um, you know, the first item of, of the, uh, the discharge is basically talking about one of the roof discharge um, points. Um, we did in, in a, a letter that that was probably received while Ross was writing this letter, um, did provide uh, calculations showing that the discharge from that, that pipe and its associated outlet protection um, is, is a non-erosive velocity. And um, certainly we can discuss exactly what um, permanent establish of vegetation means um, in, in that regard. Um, I think that's, that's relatively, relatively easy. Um, the second one, this is the first time anyone has mentioned um, 10 feet of, of separations. It's the first time that comment has come up in a, in a couple of rounds of comments here. So we'll kind of get back to you on that topic. Um, the third one, which is the probably the, the biggest one, is, as Ross mentioned, um, you know, they asked for um, additional information about some of the the variables that we used and how we determined them. And, and you know, we can we can provide that information. Um, going into it here is very technical, and and um, you know, I don't want to burn with her with that. And then the last one we had actually um, previously that that was a comment um, in in Ross's original letter. Um, that we had agreed to, we put it in the um, in the stormwater report, um, and we can certainly add those as as no plan requirements. It's basically just um, you know some cleanup of stuff before we we connect the the townhouse um, roof drains into the systems. If we use um, asphalt shingles, which I mean I, I don't know at this point if we're going to use asphalt shingles, but certainly if we do, uh, that's a perfectly reasonable requests. Um, and we have no issue with that. Okay. Um, so to the commission, uh, looking for questions for either Ross or Dominic on this. Um, and I'm not uh, seeing any. And so I'll start out, maybe that'll help. Um, so I guess a number four on the hatch, uh, the late hatch, uh, uh, the latest hatch um, report talks about the asphalt shingles. What I was wondering about that is, um, are you going to set up something at the discharge point to uh, manage the water until uh, this, till that area is uh, is vegetated? Is do I have that? I don't know if so I have the, the right that, one. Those, yeah, that one's a little. Um... You're kind of combining one. Yeah, I'm combining two, but I think that's number one I was talking about. So, yeah, and so what we what we have on that outlet pipe is is a, a riprap dissipation pad. So basically, there's a detail in the plan set. It's a, a riprap. It bowls down a little and has an area that that is a level spreader and causes the the pipe outlet to the pipe discharge water to slow down, goes over that bridge. And spreads out in what you know what's called sheet flow, which is that slower velocity spread out flow, um, and that's the calculation we provided. Was we modeled that? You usually, don't model that. We modeled that in to show um, in the hundred year storm, it's actually it, it's less than two feet per second, um, which is which is a non erosive velocity. Um, you know what we'll what we'll do is I mean so that. That outlet gets built, that outlet protection gets built as soon as that pipe is built and ready to discharge anything at any point, um, which obviously comes once really the building is is sort of tight and enclosed and the roof is actually catching rainwater and, and discharging. Um, and what I imagine we'll do is, yeah, provide, I mean, that area is is a little bit depressed as you go away from the building already and will probably provide some sort of temporary settling basin or something um, during construction until everything can can fully be established. Yeah, so what my con concern is, and I'm going to skip back to the uh, uh, asphalt shingles. Uh, so I see the roof going on quickly and the gutter system going in and the downspouts going on, if that's the way you're going to work this. Um, 
as soon as possible because it manages the mess that's around the building. And since it can't go into the discharge, uh, the underground infiltration system, where is it going to go and how do you propose to manage that until all the gravel that's from the roof uh, that gets into the gutters is cleaned out? And then again, so the the problem with, from what I hear from uh, Ross, the problem with those little granule um, asphalt stones is they'll get into the crevices and block up the infiltration system. So it sounds like a smart idea, but and but how are you going to uh, manage that system until everything's ready and the, I guess the gutters can be cleaned out? Well, initially, I mean, it'll be a system where we'll work with the contractor again, basically uh, like a temporary settling basin or a, or a small diversion swale that'll route it to a, a temporary settling basin on on site as these yeah. things. And then once once you know once the roof is on and the shingles are established, and I mean, honestly, I was even thinking from the concept of their description of when they go on, you know. You, get a hose up there and wash them down or something to, to sort of speed up that process of of getting really it's kind of the stuff as you bang the shingles in that that breaks loose uh, and then once you know once that's kind of done it's just your typical roof um which which as you know doesn't require treatment under sure treatment. I think if you're if you're diverting the water once into it's it. kind of there, once it's kind of done and that's all cleaned yeah. up, you know, then that connection gets made underground. And sure. So yeah, it's good if it's going into a settling basin, that that's fine. Stone's going to drop quick. So I think that's great. We'll just have to think about maybe a condition on how long that happens and you know when when. But but I'm glad that you're prepared to not connect it immediately. I see yeah. uh, Nathaniel Stevens hands is up thanks um uh, and with the risk of getting too technical uh dom you mentioned that you guys were to revise do some revisions to your storm your uh, mounting analysis i believe you said I, well i didn't say revision i said what, what what they've asked for is basically backup information right is is where did you come up with some of this information Oh, okay. Because, all right, well, I guess related to the mounting analysis, we had a comment from Scott Horsley, and so I just want to turn to it so I don't butcher it because it's quite technical. Uh, he mentioned that your groundwater analysis was based, relied on a modeled infiltration duration of 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.46 days, which is about 1.1 hours to simulate the impacts of a 24-hour storm, and he says the stormwater report did not provide an explanation. I don't know if that's the information you're going to provide, or yeah, that 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 is part of the information that um, uh, I believe Ross asked for. Okay, I was entitled the duration of infiltration period, which is one of the questions. Okay, great, because he just goes on to say, and he did I did check this in the handbook that it requires that the groundwater modeling analysis be conducted for the 24-hour design storm, 10, 24, and 100-year uh, events. Um, so no storm side duration by definition, as you know, Dom, but maybe others don't have a duration of 24 hours. So that's also, I was hoping that that can be addressed. And it sounds like you're headed that way to do that. Yes. Thanks. So any other questions from the Conservation Commission? So I'm just going to follow up with one other question. So um, Dominic, uh, you, you know, I've been concerned about the sump pumps and I know it was just mentioned, but it makes a lot of sense that these units are going to have sump pumps. And you haven't determined that yet, but I was just, I'm still wondering where that discharge, if they were needed, is going to go. And the reason why I'm concerned about that, probably unlike anyone else in the neighborhood is because per 10.04 in the definitions again one of the examples of alteration would include lowering wall water um, water levels or the water table so it 
it concerns me that with with all these new buildings possibly discharging uh, just to keep the basements dry, I, I'm concerned where that water is going and that we're not going to have some sort of alteration. So I don't know if you're prepared for that question, but if you are, great. But I, I did <laughs> ask it at the last meeting. So, um, um, so what we'll be working ultimately as the building design progresses, um, as, as we get into building permit stages, the foundations and the foundation waterproofing and, and potentially any need for sump pumps will be determined by the foundation designer in, in coordination with um, McPhail Associates as the geotechnical uh, engineer on the project. They've been the geotech since the, the project was in the comp permit process. Um, they are in the process of updating a memo that they did for um, during the comp permit process uh, regarding foundations and groundwater elevations. Um, they're updating it with respect to um, when they wrote that memo originally, um, the, the main building garage was actually lower. It's um, actually a little bit higher now than it was. Oh, sorry, I'm just pulling something up. Um, and so one of the things, and, and obviously, like I said, that memo is being updated, but um, they did provide, um, you know, in that memo, and I'll just read this as part of it from 2021, um, where they said that the slab should be designed as a waterproof slab and waterproofing extend up the foundation walls to the ground service surface, sorry. This will protect the garage from groundwater intrusion and from seasonal fluctuations in the groundwater level. At this point, by the way, I'll just interrupt that the garage, at that point, the garage was actually a little bit below groundwater level. It's come up since then. Um, given that the garage is only slightly below the observed groundwater level and the groundwater gradient is relatively flat, the garage should not have an impact on seasonal groundwater fluctuations or on the groundwater gradient parentheses flow in the area surrounding the proposed building. So, as I said, the geotechnical engineer and the foundation designers will be determining that, um, you know, any sump pumps will will discharge in a, in, in a legal manner, um, whatever that that may be. Um, but like I said, that the need for some pumps or anything like that is is determined at a, a later process in the in the in the permitting stage. So if a if a sump pump for a single family house or one of your units was running twenty four seven, how much discharge do you think that would account for? Are you moving over ten thousand gallons, hundred thousand gallons? I mean, 10,000 gallons sounds like a lot. I mean, I, 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 I honestly don't know. All right. Well, it's still, it's a question that's out there. I know that you said in a legal manner, but it, it's, it's connected to the Wetlands Protection Act and lowering groundwater levels. So I'd like to get closer to an answer. Maybe when that, um, that memo is updated, you can provide that to the commission. Yeah, that's the intent. Okay. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Thank, thank you. I have to lower my hand now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> previously, we had talked about it at the uh, last hearing um, that test pit seven, which is directly over the infiltration unit, the larger infiltration unit is my understanding, was um, unreliable. I, I believe those were the words. I, I'm, I'm not a stormwater expert, so excuse me if I'm butchering it a little bit. Um, and that therefore um, the uh, test pit, I believe four, whichever one was the more conservative number was being used um, <clears throat> as the seasonal high, to develop seasonal high groundwater. So I'm thinking this is inconsistent with the stormwater handbook guidelines. Um, because it's not at over the infiltration unit. And even though it looks like maybe the project is using a more conservative level, how do we know if we did 
did monitoring wells that we wouldn't even get a more conservative level in this area. I don't know. So I, it's just a question I have. Um, it seems inconsistent to me if if you could address that. Well, so one, I would say it's test for seven isn't unreliable. Um, that's, um, I, I believe, someone who is working opposed to the project um, said that. But OK, it, excuse me. But the, mm -hmm. the question was, is there was some redox feature, some modeling found in test pit seven. And the question was, why didn't we use that to determine groundwater elevation? And as I explained at the last hearing, and I believe your peer reviewer confirmed my statement. So the way you do this, when you use redox, right? I'll try to make this as untechnical as I can, right? Basically you do these test pits, you're digging a hole, a big hole. And on the wall of that hole in the dirt, you look for these redox features, right? Some are basically dirt is tan or brown for the most part. And some of these redox features are, are lighter. Some of them are darker. They have a purple coloring depending upon the minerals involved. And when you see a certain, you look down and if you see them, when you see a certain percentage of them, you continue you sort of, generally what you're doing is you're in the hole, you sort of draw a little line where they start seeing that percentage and you look down in the hole. If that percentage or more of those redox features shows all the way to the bottom of your hole, to wherever you've dug your hole, that's a groundwater. That's what we had in test pit five, right? We saw the redox features. The top of that percentage was at elevation 3.98. Looking down the hole, they're there the whole way. That's a groundwater. In test pit seven, you saw some. You went down a little ways. They were there. And then they stop. And so the rest of the test pit, there were none. So when you have that, that's that's an indicator that like at some point as water seeped into the ground, maybe it got hung up there for a little while, something happened that, that caused those little color variations, but it's not ground, it's not a seasonal high groundwater elevation. And that's the process that the state has has put together. That's the process that's used under the Wellness Protection Act, and that's why it's consistent. So in these cases where in many other cases, when you're doing test pits in a, in a month like May, like we were, or November or something like that, and groundwater elevations are normal or high, you know, you're not in a drought, which we determine, we've all determined, and I believe, I think David Morgan determined it in the first hearing, groundwater elevations when we were doing these test pits was in normal elevations. Um, a lot of times, most of the times, what people do when they don't see redox is they they see groundwater, which we saw much deeper. And that's where they say groundwater. What we did is rather than do that, we said, we have this redox feature, which is farthest away from the wetlands, right? And as people presented previously, groundwater levels, the groundwater flow is expected to go towards the wetlands. So you expect that if anything, as it heads in that direction, groundwater is going to be a little lower, a little lower elevation as we get where like test pit seven is in the infiltration system is. And we said, we're not going to call it lower. We're going to call it the exact same thing that we found in the worst case scenario that we found on the entire project site. We said, this is the highest groundwater elevation we found anywhere. And this is what we're going to use for everything. So we took a very conservative approach Rather than try to say something was lower, rather than try to say that we, we just said, we're going to use the worst case scenario for us, and that's what we're going to stick. So let me just ask one follow-up. Thanks for explaining that. Um, the the one follow-up is, is it your opinion? So it, it, it appears that there's a lot of variability on this site um, in groundwater elevations, at least in, in my very, you know, limited experience of, of looking at groundwater at projects that come before the commission. Um, so there is a lot of variability in, in a kind of a smaller area. Um, do you believe that this this method that you used is more reliable than, than doing uh, monitoring well, um, getting monitoring well data over a few months and actually seeing what it is? Is, is that your opinion? I think generally speaking, it's going to be more conservative mm -hmm. because the redox, that top redox is, is a seasonal high. It doesn't mean every year it gets there. It doesn't mean 
it's even going to get there in the period that you watch it. It means that it gets there enough to leave that mark. And that's sort of, that is the standard that is used, which is why, again, we use the highest thing. You know, you can observe these groundwater. And as I said, we did this in May, we saw groundwater, but all of the physical groundwater we saw, regardless of where it is, was much lower than this. And that was in what USGS referred to as normal groundwater conditions. So again, Thank we, you. we tried yeah. to use Thank you. Could could I, um, um, Chair, would you mind if I ask the same question to our peer reviewer? Please. Okay. So, um, Ross, could you answer the same question? What do you think would be more reliable? The 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 taking the the highest redox point, even if it's not over the infiltration system, given the inconsistencies at the site, or doing getting monitoring well data real for several months and, and doing it from them. I am not a soil here. scientist. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I got to be careful. I'm a stormwater engineer. I'm not a soil scientist, nor am I a geotechnical engineer. There's a reason that those professionals exist and they provide their thoughts on this. As I've said a few times, the margin of error on the site is very tight. The, the applicant meets the standard, which is using the redox method. Can I add to that, please? Yes, I, um, sure. yep. I'm also with Ross. I'm with Hatch. This is Duke. Um, I'm, I'm a conservation commissioner over in Lexington. I've been there for 25 years, and I've gone through many, many test pit analysis. And what we do is we, we, we uh, favor <clears throat> this method of using redox, which is the estimated seasonal high water table, which is what Dominic was saying. So you can find groundwater that fluctuates and in certain seasons it's higher than the estimated season. Like the, the people who call in and say, take a look at my photographs, look how high the groundwater is. Well, that's true. And then most of the year it's, it's actually lower than the estimated seasonal high water. But when, when we make a determination, <clears throat> um, especially when we're doing um, infiltration, we're looking for that two feet of separation. We're looking for the estimated seasonal water. And that's where we use soil scientists to go out there and they have their little book and they're looking at the, the, the I think it's the moles um, <clears throat> book for coloration. And we're trying to determine that higher elevation that you can see. And we as a commission will require that they do the test bit information um, <clears throat> over the area that they're doing their infiltration, proposing their infiltration devices. So that that's, that's what we've done. And I think that's um, what the uh, most conservative way that's been put forth by the stormwater handbook. Thank you. Uh, so yes. your nope. so your um your recommendation is doing another test pit if if test pit seven is not giving reliable data, taking another test pit under the infiltration chamber and uh seeing where the redox is in that in that second test pit and that was yeah, that was my what was going to be my follow-up to susan's question to dominic and dominic I, I was wondering like you know to, just to just to put you on the spot a little bit east arlington has been flooding for years you guys must have known that there's been a problem out there forever and people have been telling everybody who's in quasi town role that they need help. And and you're out there and you take a test pit and I get it. And you must have known that stormwater and groundwater and flooding is going to be a big deal in this uh, application. And so I'm curious why with all the time it's taken to even get to this point, why there wasn't just three months somewhere where you could have put some wells in, a bunch of wells, just all over the place, and then monitored them. I know they, it might have been expensive, but this is, a, this is a big project. And if you ever thought of it that way, I, it, it seemed like maybe you, you did what you thought was needed, but you didn't look to... Um, kind of like overcoming, you know, what 
what the neighborhood believes and what, what's been happening to East Arlington. So I'm also at a point where I'm, I'm wondering why you're not doing monitoring wells and, and you had a great explanation on the uh, seasonal high ground water. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit and then also talk about why you didn't uh, just do another test pit next to, or at least underneath that chamber somewhere else. Well, well, Mr. Chairman, we have three test pits in there. Where you were very focused on test pit seven because uh, someone brought up the fact that there was modeling in there and implied that we should have used that as the groundwater. Test pit eight is in that same system and showed we found we found sitting groundwater at elevation two and a half, well below where we're you know a foot and a half lower than what we're using. Um, and test pit, I forget if it's two or three from the original set of test pits we did in 2020 in November, where again, we found groundwater significantly lower than the elevation that we're using. So again, I put forth, we are using the most conservative method that that is is the standard of the practice. And, and as for flooding in the area, I'm not gonna deny there's flooding in the area, but there is a lot of causes for flooding, um, including, you know, there's, there's there's a catch basin on the corner of Dorothy and Little John that goes to a town-owned drain that clearly has never been maintained. There's an easement, there's easements through this site that have clearly never been maintained because they're massively overgrown. Um, so there's a lot of causes of flooding. It's not just groundwater. Mm. Yeah, but we yeah. don't want to we don't want to add nothing to the flooding, and we certainly want to make everybody feel a confident that and, and you know, the project is going but again this you know. is this is is the the standard practice in the industry the way we did it and the approach that we took again is conservative compared to what is done a lot yeah and, sure so yeah. my and my I, question and I would is also suggest that we're guided here by what the state requirements are we're adhering to that we're using the most conservative and i i think that you know if if the commission is is you know, looking at other projects in this neighborhood, which I know you are right now, has this standard that you're proposing been applied to these other projects? I don't think so. So we're asking for a consistency, not arbitrary or capriciousness. We understand this project isn't um, desired by certain people, but the review and, you know, to Hatch's credit, they're, they're looking at the standards of the state standards, and, and that's what we're talking about. Um, the, the what ifs and the worst case scenarios and is the groundwater higher than our conservative or are we going to do something that's going to lower the groundwater? Um, those are all a bunch of maybes that that people that are opposing a project you typically hear from. Um, we will respond to the most recent hatch um, once, once we've had a time to really fully review it. Um, as noted, it really wasn't given to us formally yet. Um, but I, I think that a lot of these what if scenarios um, are, are based on conjecture and they're not based on the standards. And I just want to make certain that our discussion here is under the state standards. Yeah, so I'm the one that asked about the discharge. So I haven't made my mind up yet. So I want to make sure that that's clear, even though I did say I was concerned about groundwater levels. But so getting back to my question, um, because I do think it's relevant, I'm just wondering, is it not standard when you get a bad report on a on a test pit to not to do one next to it? I understand you have it's, another I, one I have underneath that invitation. I'm sorry, yeah. I have to politely disagree with you. We don't have a bad result on a test pit. That is a wildly misleading statement, and I'm sorry I'm getting upset, but that is a wildly misleading. You have statement. my permission to correct it, but I don't there know how you would characterize a bad it. Bad result on the test pit. We did the test pits in according with the standards, and this is what we found. Redox features do not. So you're satisfied with the numbers that you got from that test pit? I'm very satisfied with the numbers I got from that test pit. And we used way worse numbers for our for our design. So you we wouldn't, you don't, use... we don't need to do another test pit and we don't need to do monitoring wells because we have three what you have out there is adequate. And all of the information that we have in those test okay. pits is worse than what we use for design. I just, again, By a lot. it might not be the wetlands protections. Uh, I'm just saying it seems like that you might want to, you know, kind of make people feel confident. And I'm sure 
confidence isn't in the WPA, but again, you're, you're, it's two battles that everybody has to fight. I know you have to talk to us and then we have 47 people here online that are all concerned about this project and you have an opportunity to make them feel a little bit better. So that's all I was getting at. So I'm gonna to turn to Nathaniel Stevens right now. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Dom, sorry, just to, you were explaining earlier, I think one of your first comments was, again, you saw in test pit, oh God, sorry, it's late, test pit seven, you saw modeling start at a level, but it didn't continue down through the test pit, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Thanks. So what elevation did you start seeing that, I'm going to say in, incomplete or, I guess, yeah, what elevation did you first start seeing modeling, even if it didn't continue down? I'd have to go back and, and look that okay. up. I, I don't know the elevation offhand. Because my, my main question is, is that higher or lower than the conservative number that you say you're using, which I think is what, 3.98? Is that right? 90, 90. Yeah. So, and I couldn't, I was looking back at the stormwater report. I couldn't tell uh, what, you know, what that level was in that test pit log, or maybe I wasn't looking at the right log about when you first started seeing yeah, that. So, I'd, ha I'd have to go back and. and okay. Uh, that, that's, if you could provide that information. The, and some of it's that we, it, it's, it's kind of goofy in a way when you do the logs you measure down from grade so right. the logs are the logs are all done in depth from grade and then you go back and figure out what the surface grade right. is and, and each and each surface grade uh, each test pit starts at a different surface grade so you've got to yeah, you know, yeah, work it out right. are, you know anywhere from i don't know seven or eight to, yeah. up to maybe 12 or something but that's why you end up putting expressing the groundwater level in a set elevation right elevation. so yes. it's so consistent that, throughout so okay yeah, yeah because you might say i mean in theory you could see you could see redox six feet below surface <clears throat> surface is 12 feet right versus you see it at you know three feet below surface but surface is five or something you know so that you you get yeah. the elevation okay so, yeah so, right, I get that. So, yeah, if you can just tell me what the elevation is that you observed first yeah. for redox features in test pit seven, seven, I think that would help me. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the Conservation Commission? And we've kind of taken this a uh, little bit of time. I can open it up to... I can open up to uh, anyone that's attending tonight's meeting, and I see that Scott Horsley has his hand up. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm actually not sure who had their hand up first. So I'm going to go with Scott Horsley if that's okay. I think, and, yeah, I, based on my observation, I think his hand has been up for quite a while. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Scott, uh, please sure. uh, uh, introduce yourself for the record. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott Horsley, I am working as a consultant to the Arlington Land Trust, and I've submitted two letters, one that I presented at your last meeting, and then a subsequent letter uh, dated February 7th that uh, attempted to clarify some of the points that I made at the prior meeting and that were discussed, and I just want to briefly address those. I don't, I, I have uh, I have the letter. I, 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 there's quotations of the Mass Stormwater Handbook, will, which will clarify, I think, some of the prior discussion. What it does say, what it doesn't say. I'll I'll, I'll paraphrase that in my own opinion. Now, if we want to look at the language, I do have it, and we can put it up and read it together. But just uh, really three comments. One is, first of all, I agree with Ross's overall characterization here. I, I, don't, think, I don't think I can quote him exactly, but walking a tight line. Uh, this site, I think most of us would agree this is um there's not a lot of room to spare here uh, it's, just, it's shallow groundwater we're we're talking about structures close if not into the water table uh, but there's not a lot of room to spare here as i think that maybe another way to ross characterize it which i totally agree with so and as you said mr chairman why not get some more data to prove this out um i i think there might be some wells in existence i'm not sure that's true or not but i've heard that and if so, then, uh, you know, why haven't they been monitored and why couldn't we start tomorrow? 
Um, if, 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 and it would also be easy to put wells in because this is shallow groundwater. So this is not a, a cost issue or a timing issue. We are coming up uh, in about two weeks on the high groundwater season, looking around the state, typically high waters observed in March, April, May. And so, as I said in my letter, if in fact we all want to get more comfortable with this and rely on actual data, we can do that, but we need to start soon. Uh, or we wait till next year, next March, April, May, but I'm not sure we want to wait that long. We have an opportunity to measure the water level during the next three months if we start soon. Again, there may be wells there or be easy to put in. Um, I, I guess what I want to address is um, some of the other questions about what do you do if you find, uh, well, first of all, I want to address uh, Nathaniel's question because I presented that elevation. If you take the modeling level in test pit seven, according to my calculations, certainly Dominic can check this and get back as I'm sure he will. I, I find it at 5.7 elevation, Nathaniel is the number. And that's in my prior letter. Okay, thank you for reminding me. Sure, sure, no problem. And my interpretation of the stormwater handbook, and again, I can show you the language if you'd like, it's in it's in my letter February 7th is, that the way uh, MassDEP uh, re recommends or requires uh, seasonal high water is to first look and see if you find uh, modeling, uh, uh, redox, as, as we've been talking about. I agree, that's, a, that's a, a good method to do that if you can get a reliable result. Um, and that there is modeling in this well, excuse me, it's test pit seven, it's at elevation 5.7. My understanding of the soil interpreter is that it was not reliable because of, I think the way Dominic explained it made sense to me. It wasn't continuous. What, what the handbook suggests at that point is to then go to wells to determine seasonal high water. And it also talks about comparing the water levels in those wells with a USGS index well. There is a statewide network. This is another routine method to determine yes, estimated seasonal high water, both for stormwater and Tidal 5 septic systems, to compare the water level measurements you're making on your site with one of these index wells to make sure that this spring is one of how it compares to the highest spring. This is, again, this, these are three standard methods. They're outlined in the handbook. The, uh, the text is in my letter. So again, the order is look for redox. If you find it, use it. If you don't, go to wells, monitor water levels through the spring season, and compare that to USGS index wells. Uh, if we want to look at the language, we can. The other thing I put in my February 7th letter, it's pretty clear to me that these measurements need to be, and I'll use the terminology in the handbook, at the location. Most people describe it as within the footprint of the infiltration. Now, Dominic's like, absolutely right. There's more than one test pit at the site, but based upon their own judgment, they don't have adequate or reliable water level data. So they're, they're proposing to use it, use the water, the, the water level data shown as the redox in well in the uh, test pit five. My, my, my estimate looking at the plants around 150 feet away, that is clearly not in compliance in my view with the stormwater handbook, which says at the location. So I sum it up with, uh, as I think a couple of people have asked um, in that, if we don't want to use the redox or if we don't think the redox uh, signature in test pit seven is reliable, then we should use wells. That's my, that's my interpretation of the handbook. I think that's what it says. And, it, and the information has to be, and I'll quote, I'll quote them again, at the location. Um, there is a lot of, a lo there has been already demonstrated, there's a lot of um, uh, differences in water levels already shown across the site. So why we think um, the number, the levels at seven are indicative of five. I'm not sure. Uh, it is it is the highest one that was found in the redox. I do agree with that, but uh, it just seems to me we need better information at this site. This is a very large infiltration system. It's very close to the water table. Uh, and then my last comment is back to the duration of the the groundwater mounting analysis. I I mentioned this at the last meeting. Uh, I think Ross mentions it in his letter. Uh, I would just ask maybe through the chair if it's appropriate to simply ask Dominic tonight just one question about it. Why are we using one hour duration? If we can just get a, a plain language answer to that, that would be really helpful, I think, to all of us. Because it, and, and as I said in my original letter, I just don't understand it. Maybe there's a good reason. 
So, so through you, Mr. Chair, if we could get yeah. an answer to that tonight, that would be really helpful. Yeah, Dominic, do you have an answer to uh, Scott Horsley's question? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would rather um, put that answer in writing. Sure. Uh, Scott, could you provide the commission that question in writing and we'll uh, relay that to Dominic Rinaldi in PSC. Oh, I, mean, I would rather put our answer in writing. I mean, it, it's fine if you want to get a, a written comment and pass it along, but um, it, we, we kind of already have that question from Ross. Okay. I, uh, Scott, I think that it would be good to still have your question in writing just to make sure that we're we're good with yeah. that. I think um, I, I think I do have it, Mr. Chair, in both the earlier letter. I'll double check. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. If you have a copy of my Feb February 7th letter, mm -hmm. and if you'd like, I can show it to you right now, but it is clearly in here, and it was in my last letter as well. And I can just read it to you. Uh, applicants groundwater mounting analysis relies upon a modeled infiltration duration of 0.46 days parentheses 1.1 hours to simulate the impacts of a 24-hour storm the stormwater report does not provide an explanation for this apparent discrepancy this suggests to me that the groundwater modeling therefore underestimates groundwater mounting at the site so that's in my current letter and i did have a similar um, comment at the last meeting and we're just not getting an answer yeah, and I, I, I did ask a question earlier about that, and Dom said he was, they were going to revise, revise, you know, provide some information about the, their mounting analysis, and, but I think, yeah, tagging on to that, yes, a, an explanation as Scott outlines would be helpful for me as well. I guess I should just make sure, do you have my February 7th letter, so do you know, um, anybody from the commission or maybe um, the staff, um, I just want to make sure you have it. Yes, it's posted on yeah. the, I'm looking at it from the right, website. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. You're welcome. Okay, David, uh, I didn't know if your question related to this because Mr. Yerwick's uh, hand's been up. Do you need David Kaplan? Sure. Um, I just had a, a follow-up question a technical question on how groundwater would be determined if we did decide to do pisometers, but I can I can table that and we can continue with public comment and I can ask that of our um, peer reviewer um, later. No, no uh, I think you have the question out there. Who's who's that directed to? Um, so I guess the question would be for Ross. You know in in reference to Mr. Horsley's letter and the consideration of pisometers to understand the water table, it does allude to um, measuring that water level at the time, but then comparing it to USGS index wells to understand whether or not this was uh, above normal year, normal year, below normal year. I just wanted to understand that a little better because I mean, if we do decide that we're going to go down this path, that additional groundwater uh, level information is needed and that pisometers need to be installed, this is, you know, an above normal rain year. And I imagine that the water will probably be higher than what the applicant observed at the time of the test pits. So I, I just want to, I just want to understand how that information is normalized. So it's uh, kind of an objective look at what the estimated seasonal high groundwater level is and not just we're holding them to a standard where they need to look at everything from the highest groundwater level or, or one of the higher groundwater levels that we may see this spring. Does that, does that make sense, uh, long-winded? Could you maybe provide a, a what, what's the one sentence question in there? Um, okay. Um, they, uh, we've installed pisometers. We're measuring the water table in the spring of 2024. It's an abnormally wet year. The groundwater level is high. How is that normalized to uh, a seasonal water level? 
Right. Do, do you have... I can just jump in. The Stormwater Handbook, I think I understand what, just to give some context, Stormwater Handbook, as Scott quotes, is uh, it says when redox features are not available, installation of temporary push point wells or piezometers should be considered. Ideally, such wells should be monitored in the spring when groundwater is high, highest. And importantly, the results are compared to nearby groundwater wells monitored by the USGS to estimate whether regional groundwater is below normal normal or above normal. So I think Dave Kaplan, you're asking, how do you, we find out it's below normal, then how do you adjust the results that we get from the monitoring wells, right? It, it, exactly, I just, if they, you know, wherever the water level is, is gonna push the project, you know, one direction or another. So I just, how does that remain an impartial look of an estimated seasonal high groundwater level when redox is not available. Just wanted to understand that. Let's say the water level is normally at four, but this spring it's measured at six. You know, how, to, how does that do then? They still have to design to the normal four. And, and it's because it seems to me that redox is the way to get that information. We're looking at an area that fluctuates, you know, from high groundwater to low groundwater. And we want to design to where we see it in the middle. That's, we seem to have those redox characteristics. So I'm just, I guess I'm a little skeptical about the additional information that we would get from installing monitoring wells. But if we do, I just want to make sure that it's normalized in a way that's, um, you know, uh, I guess fair and impartial to the to the process. Um, I I do not have an opinion on that. I I would lean on some of my geotechnical um, colleagues probably and, and run that by them. Uh, do, Duke, do you have anything? I I could provide you an answer in writing from them though, if, if that's helpful. No, I, as as I said before, in 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 our town, we we use the redox methodology. And we use them in, in the areas um, in proximity to the test pits. And, and if we don't, and we're, we're out there, the commissioners are out there with a professional wetland scientist while they do this. And you typically have where you have fluctuating water table like this, and we're close to the water table, you really have good redox um, readings. You really have good measurements. So if, if one of these is in question, and it was our commission, I would go back to the test pit and do another test pit in proximity and say, and take another look and say, how does this compare to the seasonal water, estimated seasonal water table that we came up with the first one? Is it is it lower than, than the anomaly that Dominic's talking about because it's not a constant modeling all the way down to the bottom? And if it is, you know, what's that elevation? And how does that compare to some of the other redox elevations that we've seen? That, that, that's what we would do. And I'm not, I'm not a hydrologist, but we, we rely on the soil scientists to do that. And, it, and it's pretty straightforward and they can do it with a, a soil pro. I mean, Dominic, I mean, is that, I'm assuming that's how they did it for the, the three pit, test pits that were done, correct? I mean, didn't, were they using soil probes or were they using uh, the test pits or would it be easy to do a, a soil probe? We did uh, uh, test pits, with, uh, yeah. sorry for some feedback there. Um, but I hope that, hope that was me. Um, we did a, we did full test pits with a, a small excavator. Would, would, would it be easy to go out there and do a soil probe? Because we're only talking about if it's, well, if it's two or three feet below um, the actual ground elevation, it would be easy to do it with a soil probe. Is, is that possible? We weren't seeing groundwater two to three feet below. Well, surface. it depends on what what time of the year you go out there. But were you seeing were you seeing the modeling? <clears throat> uh, the modeling in that test pit was uh, a little over four feet. Okay, so it, in that case, you probably would need a test pit, and and you wouldn't be able to rely on a soil probe, right? So you yeah. would you would go out and do another test pit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the, the modeling we saw in that test pit was 51 inches down and the uh, the 
groundwater elevations were all 60 plus. And that, that was in May or June, did you say? Yeah. And then we saw, we saw pretty hear. similar results when we did them in November of 2020 in some different spots. The design was different, so the, the locations were a little different. Those are those three 2020 test pits that are included in the stormwater report. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to John. Uh, Chuck, your wicks. Whoops. What? Chuck, sorry. Before you go, before you get off this point, um, I don't know. You know, Scott. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave. David asked the question to both our peer reviewer and Dom about what the. Uh, you know, if we went down this path of, of monitoring what it would do and how do you correlate the results? And I was going to say, you know, there's also someone else here who I know has had a lot of experience with us. I ask if uh, Scott Horsley could provide any uh, perspective on that question. I, I can, Nathaniel, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, so the, there is actually a method to do this, to compare the me on-site measured water levels with these USGS index wells. And I can attempt to provide a very simple explanation of how this is done. There's actually a report by USGS that is used routinely to do this. But essentially what happens is you go out and measure at your site and you get that water level during the spring. And then you look at a, an index well that's uh, matched to the site. And I won't go into the detail of how you do that, but generally speaking, it's a relatively nearby well in a similar hydrologic setting. And that index well has a long-term database. So it measures water levels, let's say over a 20 year period. And you look at where the water level is in that index well at the date that you're measuring on this site. And then you look at the difference between where that is at the index well and the highest point, and that's called an adjustment. So it might be, let's say 1.5, two feet different. So then you'd add that to your measured water level on this site. Essentially what you're doing is you're using the index well as a long-term record to, nor somebody used the term normalize before, to normalize your measurement, because as we've said a number of times here, the spring is generally the high time of the year, but we don't know whether it's March, April, or May, first of all, and varies quite a bit. And then we don't know whether this year is as wet as other years. So the way to normalize that is to compare it to the long-term USGS record. And that's what that's what MassDEP is referring to in the handbook with the stuff that uh, I think Nathaniel read would be to compare the piezometer readings to that USGS index wells. I hopefully that was helpful. It's, it's it's a little bit more detailed than that, the actual method, but that's essentially how you do it. Thanks. It was helpful to me. Hopefully to Dave as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Sorry to interrupt. But I just no, not a problem. I just want to make sure everyone's finished with this point. I want to let uh, John uh, Yorks has his hand up for a very long time. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, oh that's good. My name is John Yorowich, 57 year resident of the town, 40 years on the corner of Little John and Mott. And uh, Chairman Tironi has mentioned three times uh, neighborhood confidence. Um, my confidence was in this project was low all along. It got considerably lower after tonight's meeting in listening to all the standardized measurements and readings that are made in an area that has a high risk factor. We stand to lose a lot, the neighbors in this, in this, in this area. Uh, every one of them at, at some high storm days have had pipes coming out of their cellars, out of their garages, out of their cellar windows. It's, we don't want that to happen again. If this development is built, you're, you're, you're making a huge concrete hole in the ground where those aquifers are going to get damaged enough to vary all the patterns, all the flows that this groundwater is taking. Just take one reading and call it the groundwater is at four. And like the, the, someone said, what if it's measured to six? What do you design for? Well, all we need is one six to show up after this thing is built and the whole neighborhood is having water in their basements. We don't want that. This is, of all the, of all the impacts this development is gonna have on this neighborhood, of all, the, of all the impacts, and there are many, you know that, uh, 
This one here is the worst. It has a major cost risk to every neighbor in this area. Everyone, people that have eight steps up to their first floor or two steps up to their first floor, we're John, all going to have problems. Yes. John, do you have a, so um, I'd like to keep this at a high level and I know that there's a lot of anxiety out there, but if you had a question, um, so we, I think they know Hello? that there's, there's been flooding. Is there a, uh, some part of the process that you wanted to ask a question about other than to say that you're, you're um, not very confident about how the measurements were taken? So unless I ask a technical question, my time is worthless. I just don't want you to, so we don't want to, um, uh, you know, just start um, teeing off on, on people. Okay. So I, so I want you to just, if you just had a question and I think that would be good for everyone. Also, if you have a question, that's great. I think it's understood that this is this area and East Arlington floods and there's a concern out there. So I don't want to, uh, you know, shorten your time in any way. But I just want to have some ground rules. Okay. So, all right, you've made test pits and read the groundwater levels. There's talk about pisometers. Uh, there's talk about more test pits. Uh, the the engineer, I forget, Dominic, I think, uh, gave us the answer that he didn't have his his stats with him tonight. Uh, well, if, if if I was going to go to a meeting and the crux of the matter was groundwater, I'd sure have my briefcase full of all my groundwater stats. I would like to suggest that we do more than standard for groundwater testing in this area. Whatever the standard is, you know, you, you dig three test pits, that ain't going to cut it. We need test pits to, to replicate the test pits 50 feet away, 20 feet away. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt with my tirade but no I'm i think very it... con very concerned neighbor um we've, we've been fighting this property now for 50 or more years okay now it's now because of 40b the state says you can build down here why how wetlands were always sanctified land don't build on wetlands now we can build on wetlands something's wrong with that uh chairman i'm sorry i blew off steam but understand it's going to impact us in the end thank you for listening good night i understand I, and i certainly heard you want more testing um susan stam would you uh just introduce yourself uh for the uh for the record please hi there uh can you hear me and see me yes <clears throat> thank you i am a town media member across the street from this project in uh, precinct three and been following this project for for a long time. And I have a, a layperson's question, which is, we have been talking about and feeling the effects of climate change for quite a while, but particularly in the last couple of years. And the, um, <clears throat> the, and the governor in her recent State of the State address talked about uh, future-proofing, quote unquote, our communities. Um, I've been listening to the discussions of the data, which I barely understand on um, the last several weeks. And, and I keep, and I, and I just wonder why there's, it's all based on the past, what's happened in the past, when we can see that we're getting heavier rains, um, more increased uh, weather and flooding. And I'm assuming that if you could make some reasonable predictions based on the last few years and predictions of what climate change is going to do, that you would somehow apply those factors, <clears throat> and by you I mean the engineers, uh, to the the numbers. Um, and uh, but I would um, but I would like to ask that question: is to is there any consideration, or are you able to give any consideration for the well known fact that there's going to be a lot more flooding and intense weather coming our way? Thank you. Chuck, do you want me to answer that? Uh, sure, Nathaniel. Sure, Susan. Unfortunately, we're dealing with regulations that have not been updated in over a decade to reflect these climate change measures. And actually, just uh, right before Christmas, DEP 
which uh, whose regulations were operating under finally after much prodding and pushing released draft regulations which would incorporate climate change measures mm -hmm. and allow conservation commissions to ask for that type of information but unfortunately our hands are tied at the at this um on those matters so we have to look sort of backwards as you say we have to rely on out of date uh, data um, I'm trying to remember, I think actually in this instance, the applicant did voluntarily use uh, some less out of date rainfall data in preparing their stormwater report. I think that they did, did because it, it's, cons yeah, in the, in the comprehensive permit, so um, use no Bill and I had, had some sway in, in, in making sure that they oh. used what's called the NOAA 14, 14 plus data, set. Eight so data if, set, right, which is newer I, than if I may, Mr. Chairman, too, we actually have updated that for this application in the comprehensive permit. We use NOAA 14. Um, in this application, we used what the town refers to as NOAA 14 plus plus, which is the which short NOAA 14. They give you a range of numbers um, and, a, and a number to use and what the town bylaw requires is no what you call NOAA 14 plus plus, which is the highest number in that range. And that's what we're using for our rainfall data. So we are using, even though we are not required to comply with the Arlington bylaw, we are using the rainfall requirement that the Arlington bylaw requires, which for reference, the, the requirements under the stormwater standards, as, as Nathaniel was saying, are, are outdated. Like a hundred year storm in this area is probably somewhere around seven inches in 24 hours. The NOAA 14 number what, that we used for the comp permit was somewhere around 10. We're using something like, it, it's a little over 11 inches in 24 hours. So it's 60% it's higher than the state standard. So we are actually taking into account the impacts of climate change in our stormwater management system. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, again, I see uh, Robert DiBiase, uh, but I didn't know if um, Brian McBride had a follow up question to the NOAA 14 plus plus. So no, it's regarding the test bit, Chuck. Sure. So let's just hold, uh, let me get. Uh, uh, Robert DiBiase, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask a quest your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have three uh, parts of the question here. One is, uh, I was wondering if the... Hmm. Uh, Did you Robert, freeze? If, yeah, if you, if you can hear us, you might want to turn off your video and then just ask your question. And see if you can come back online. You're frozen. So we'll get back to uh, Mr. DiBiase in a few minutes. Uh, Brian McBride, why don't you ask your question? Yeah, I, I'm sorry if this is a basic question, but I guess this is to, to Duke um, and uh, Ross regarding the um, the impact of doing it. If we ask the applicant to do an additional test pit or well, um, I think uh, Dominic has said they've used sort of the worst case scenario. Uh, in regard to the two-foot buffer, and, and you said, Duke and, and Ross, that it, the calculations came very close to that requirement of two feet, but past it. Um, if they do an additional well or test pit, is it likely that that would actually impact that two feet number? Would, would it have to be the worst case scenario plus something? And how would that play out in terms of the calculation if we do an additional well in terms of changing the, the pass fail at that two feet. Yeah, thanks for that. So the, the standard is that there is two feet of separation between the bottom of an infiltration device that's used for stormwater management and the seasonal high groundwater. And you, and you want that two feet so that that water is percolating through the soil um, and you get your, your treatment uh, through that percolation. You, you, you grab the benefits of mother nature by doing that. So as, as said, their, their water, the highest seasonal high groundwater level was at 3.98. And the bottom of the infiltration features across the site is at six. 
and 3.98 is right next to four. So about four. And so six minus four is two feet. Um, and so really this whole discussion about the seasonal high groundwater level, it, it, if the value was determined to be greater than four by some other process, all of the infiltration devices um, would need to be reconfigured. Um, so so they're, they're pretty big design impacts on that front. It, did I get, did I answer your question? Yeah, so if that one well, that, say we redid that one well has been discussed, there's some suspicion about, um, is it likely that that would um, change the result, um, given what you know about the redox and the water level observed? Would it have to be some phenomenally surprising situation for that one well to give a, a game-changing result, or is that within the realm of possibilities and therefore something that we really need to pursue? If if the well, the, this hypothetical well had a redox level greater than four, then yes, there would be, um, it would, this the site would need to be reconfigured. Um, okay. That will be what we'd be interested to find out then. Uh, Mr. DiBiase, um, I see that you've back online. Would you like to continue with your question? Thank you. Somehow, all of a sudden, it seemed like we ran out of Zoom time. My screen went blank. My question really was, um, are there wells on site? And I'm not sure if that question was answered after I was offline. Uh, there are. There... There are wells on site, but they're not being monitored. Okay. Okay, they're not being monitored. So they were a point in time uh, well. And so I don't think there's any other data. If I've said that wrong, Dominic or Ross, let me know. But that's that's how I see it. All right. I was just curious about that because I spoke with the gentleman when they installed them back in June or July and they said somebody was going to be monitoring them, and I have yet to see that happen. And I was curious about that. Yeah, so I I, I believe it was actually uh, suggested by the town engineering department to put in those um, PVC, those white PVC pipes. Um, that That's what I heard when I was out on a, on a site visit. But Dominic, that was your, and I noticed you unmuted. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it was a request by um, the town engineer. Um, we were doing the test pits. We were coordinating them with the um, uh, Whitestone engineering that the town hired to observe them at the same time. Um, and, um, and I apologize, I'm about Wayne, Wayne Schoenard. Is town engineer? Wayne Schoenard. Wayne Schoenard, sorry. Um, pronounced that wrong. If he's here, I apologize. Um, and he requested that we put them in. Um, as to answer the the gentleman's question, I don't know who he talked to at that point. Um, he said he talked to, uh, I think he said he talked to a, a male, um, which the only male out there that was from our company or our side of the equation would have been me for part of the day. And I definitely didn't talk to anybody and tell them anything about what we would be doing. So if he talked to somebody, he talked to somebody wasn't part of the project team. Could have I been spoke. somebody from Whitestone, you know, but he is obviously not. I spoke with the gentlemen that were installing the, the wells at the time. There was four gentlemen out there with the excavator and they had a bunch of other equipment and you were not present at the time. I live right next door to the property yeah. and I just walked over and I said, what are you guys doing today? And they said, we're installing several wells. And I said, are they going to be monitored? And they said, I believe so. But that's where they left it at. So mm. um, my curiosity, obviously, is being a neighbor to this, is what's going on. They're there. Why aren't they being monitored? If that's a source of data, why aren't we using it? Um, you know, it's, it's important to everybody. It's important to you as well to have the truth of all this information. So, um, again, I asked this out there, if it's going to be monitored and if it's going to be made public, what the numbers are going to be. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Okay. Uh, Susan? Thank you, um, Chuck. This is just a very quick point um, because I just don't remember. I know we got a um, report from Whitestone 
which was the peer reviewer for the town for the um, estimated seasonal high groundwater um, numbers from the test pits. And I, I guess this is to our peer reviewer, Hatch. Did you review that report along with um, the applicant's stormwater report and is it consistent? I don't recall seeing anything from Whitestone specifically. And that may be our fault if we didn't forward it. <laughs> But um, just because I'm not a stormwater person and I don't remember what it said, I just wanted somebody to say on the record yes or no, that that our peer reviewer from the town that was re that produced a report on these um, test pits, it's consistent with what is in the stormwater report from BSC. I don't remember seeing that report as part of this proceeding. It would be helpful to get it into the record. Okay, so we we I didn't get it in the right. I thought it was. I thought it. I thought we had it, but maybe maybe I have it from another place, which would. Hmm. I thought we had it. Sorry, Nathaniel. It has a bearing because it's the town's peer reviewer on the test pits. It was for sure. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. I just don't remember seeing it on okay. our, the Concom website. Okay. Documents or okay, so email. that's something I, I will forward to Ryan and the chair. Right. And I think, yeah, yeah BSC, I assume, has and a copy. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, no, we don't. We've never actually been given a copy. Oh, ah, okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Distribute it well, yes, I will distribute it to everybody. And it actually, I don't know why I had it because it, it well, it went to David Morgan, but maybe it slipped through the cracks. What, okay. What's the date of the report? It, the date of the report is June 29th, 2023. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, me. I will forward it to Ryan and he can distribute it to the um to, to the applicant as well as um, to the con call. Sure. I can I'm connect. looking at our website right now and I think I see it actually um on our documents for the September 21st, 2023 meeting. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. That was um, a long time ago. It, is it the June 29th? Let me see. I just downloaded it. Let's see what it says. June 29th, 2023. Yeah, so that's it. So it's been so long we forgot about it. <laughs> it's um uh, I'm gonna link. Yeah, I see it now. Really Thanks. Cool. But but it was never included in the NOI application, correct? Any, any I think that's correct. I think it's separate. So um at least if, if it's okay with you with the chair, I would I would like our peer reviewer to tell us if that's consistent. Yeah, so <clears throat> I approve that. Thank you. Um, Ryan, uh, can you make sure that goes to the uh, Thorndike page also? Yep. It may be there, but I just want to make sure well, that, that, that's... that was what I that was what I just linked the uh, Thorndike place the page on our website. All right, so that's been up on the Thorndike page. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any more hands up. Are there, are there any other questions about stormwater tonight? I don't believe we resolved everything, but um, we discovered something that wasn't reviewed. Uh, but um, I want to <clears throat> I want to get as close to being finished with stormwater, understanding that there are questions that need to be resolved, um, and then set ourselves up for the next step, which would be the habitat eval. And I think that maybe we're at a point where I'm not going to start that tonight, but <clears throat> we can look at finishing up stormwater and talking about the habitat eval, eval at the next at the next conservation meeting. Um, so I just let you think about that while I take uh, Scott Will Horsley and let him ask his question. Yes, and I'll be very brief. Just on behalf of my clients, I know they're very concerned. The Arlington Land Trust sounds like we did establish the wells are in place on the site. Um, it, it, could we ask through you, Mr. Chair, if the client is willing to measure water levels in the wells they installed? Uh, I'm not sure why anybody would have installed wells without monitoring them, but we are coming up on the spring season, and I'm just wondering if we could either ask them or, or I might suggest the commission asked for that to mm. be done. Only because we are <clears throat> now is March 1st, and uh, it just seems like uh, 
given the discussion tonight, why would we not do that? Maybe that's the second question. If the answer is no, then the other question is why not? So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thanks. Um, I did see a hand up, but uh, I, I think that's a, an appropriate question of the commission. I think as we talk with one voice, I think commissions are, the commission from what I hear is, um, has some questions about groundwater, revolve around modeling, and that may be an appropriate question. Now I see Ben Peterson has just raised his hand. So Ben, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, one thing I'm trying to understand with the wells that, you know, from what I heard uh, Scott Horsley say, the wells were not um, at the location where the structures will be. Um, and is that true? And if so, if wells and if it would make sense to actually test the water um, depth there. So we're talking about uh, test pit number seven and a big infiltration area. There's a, there's two, or I, th I saw two, if there's three, then I didn't see the third one, but I know that there's at least two underneath that infiltration chamber. The rest of them are not being discussed. So there's, uh, there's adequate tests in those, in those areas also. So I think, um, if that answers your question. Chuck, sorry, it, I don't think that's quite right. I, I agree with you. There are two test pits at where the uh, infiltration basin is uh, proposed. I think what uh, Mr. Peterson was getting at was that the applicant has decided to base the estimated seasonal high water on another test pit because there are about eight or not eight or nine test pits throughout the site. Another test pit, which was about 150 feet away. I believe that's what Mr. Horsley said. So hopefully that clarifies. And I didn't just muddy the water even further. No, you no, know, no. I I didn't hear that part. I thought yes, that's well, exactly right. Test pit five is being used to set the water table or the water level for the entire site, um, and that's just under four feet. So. 2.98 or something like that. And they're using four throughout the site. It's a conservative, from what we hear from the applicant, it's a conservative groundwater level. And um, you, it, you know, the whole discussion tonight was about the test pits and the modeling and where it was found and, and, and you know, a lot of discussion about how the applicant wanted to use this conservative or test pit five and their reasoning behind it. And then on the other side, we heard some, some discussion about the regulations and how test pits need to be in the area of the infiltration chamber. So that's what the, what the discussion was about. Um, and at that, I think that um, between Nathaniel and myself, maybe that question was answered. So so where are, where are we in terms of wanting yes. to ask the ask the applicant to do additional? Um... Sure. Let me. So Nathaniel, just hold off for a second. Let me uh, just take Gary Goldsmith, and then but Gary's going to be our last um, uh, a resident or attendee that's at the meeting to talk, and then I want to open it up to the commission to have a discussion about where we are at this point and what we need to kind of get the stormwater information we so we can make a decision. Uh, Gary, can you please uh, unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself for the commission and for the record? Hi there, my name is Gary Goldsmith. I've lived in Arlington for 40 years. I'm on Beverly Road. Um, and I do understand, I, I come from a science-based background, so I do understand that we're always limited by the best techniques and information uh, of the time. Um, but I'm struck by, but I guess my question is, uh, and, and in a simplistic way, why is it that we are looking at stormwater, uh, excuse me, at uh, groundwater, uh, ground level, as opposed to flooding? Um, I happen to live on the lower Mystic Lake, and on any given day, the lake is, you know, a few inches higher or lower. Um, one foot of flooding happens pretty much every year. Uh, two or three feet is not uncommon, uh, but I have seen the lake up five, six, and seven feet. 
Um, so if you didn't happen to measure those years, it would just look fine. Now there's only three feet of uh, rise and flooding. Um, so I, I guess I, I understand why groundwater might be measured, but it seems to me that's not really the question that uh, we're concerned about. Uh, flooding um, is destructive to property, um, reduces tax base for the town, um, and imposes uh, costs and inconvenience on residents. Anyway, so I guess that's my question. Um, so we have addressed uh, the flood zone in this uh, application and anywhere where the uh, applicant is proposing to build in that area, they're replicating the uh, flood storage two to one is mm -hmm. my understanding. And so the flooding uh, under the regulations, and we only are working at the Wetlands Protection Act here, not our own town bylaw, but still uh, in the Wetlands Protection Act, you only need one-to-one. -one. This applicant has come in and met the town regulations of two-to-one. So flooding has been uh, the capacity to manage flooding on the site has been increased, not going to tell you that on those crazy days that it's going to work uh, to do that. But for the most part, it's going to work a lot more or, than it has been in around this property because they've increased um, the capacity two to one only in the areas that they have altered. And I don't see Dominic's unmuted, so we're going to go with that. Oh, here he is. Thank Sorry. You. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh... <laughs> That's a that's a good summary of it. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's um, we are meeting the 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 town bylaw standard, which is much stricter than the state standard that was agreed to in the comp permit process, and and that was just it's fine. It's there. It's gone. Okay, so I'm going to end the public discussion at this point, and I'm going to open it up to the commission to talk about what we need moving forward. Um, so thank you, everyone that participated in the discussion. Uh, any hands from commission members? Maybe Nathaniel, who wanted to talk before. Uh, sure, Nathaniel. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we have, I think the applicant is aware of the, the questions that we've discussed. I think the question now for the applicant is, do we want to, oh, sorry, the question for the commission to decide is, do we want to ask the applicant to do undertake the testing as outlined in the stormwater handbook in which they uh, you know, do monitoring and the upcoming couple weeks and months seem to be an ideal time to monitor that. And then you compare those results to the USGS uh, gauge. So I would suggest that we ask the applicant to do that. And if they don't wanna do that, then provide an explanation as to why not. That'll be one approach. I agree with Nathaniel. Um... Many of you know I am a scientist, so I like to make decisions based on real data. I'm not saying that redox is not real data, but um, we're making some more assumptions that in in my mind than if we had groundwater data for the next three months. That said, I would like to make the proposal that if we do this and it ends up being different than the redox numbers that are used right now for planning the project that we use the most conservative number. It's my proposal. Brian, did you wanna speak? I think you're on mute. I see your mouth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, I sort of feel like the uh, applicant has basically passed the test we asked them to pass with the with the two feet, but that because it's so very close, we could use additional assurance that there hasn't been some mistake or there hasn't been a bad well. I don't know if I'm saying the same thing as you did, Susan, but that's my feeling. So the uh, so we have, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything else other than to ask for monitoring during the spring, the three months in the spring, and then compare that to the index wells. Uh, for this region. Is there any other? I'd like to hear from Dave Kaplan because he has a good sense of water. Water yes, flows. <laughs> but you yeah. want to speak to Dave. 
What are your um, thoughts, Eric? Yeah, I'm I'm on the fence. I mean, I think you know we're we're trading one measurement for another, and you know, I'm not 100 percent convinced that their methodology was somehow incorrect or um, didn't capture you know the site um, characteristics. Um, so I think uh, I'm 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 on the fence about asking. I mean, I think if We just want to make sure if we're going to ask them to um, do additional groundwater level monitoring that it's done yeah, in accordance with the standards um, and the locations that are needed. Um, I know there was some talk about using some existing wells on site and those might not be the proper locations. So I think we just want to make sure that they're matched up with the infill infiltration basins and uh, you know where they need to be in order to make the proper determinations um but this you know with with the two feet of separation too i mean we are talking about some thin margins um you know i think if there is mounding that that comes back in into the infiltration chamber it impacts the capacity of the infiltration chamber and it has some implication on water quality and my understanding is that they're meeting the tss the water quality through proprietary separators and they're not really relying on the recharge for water quality and the site is um, they're recharging more water quality volume than they need to so I'm not sure that, you know, the mounding, even if the mounding backs up into the infiltration chamber, that that's actually going to, you know, it may periodically reduce the capacity of the storage capacity of that chamber and potentially surcharge. But if they're not breaking the surface, you know, I want to hear from the applicant whether or not that still meets like the groundwater recharge requirements and the water quality. I want to understand that, you know, if if this and we don't even know yet the mounting analysis was done incorrectly. So I feel like we need to. There are a couple of steps we need to take um, to understand if we are at the margins of the two feet. Was the mounting analysis done correctly, uh, and then possibly go go from there. Um, but again, this is this is a wet year. I don't think it's going to benefit the applicant um, to to monitor um groundwater at this point in time so i just want to make sure that that we're fair and, and how we um how we change we, we ask them to change the approach you know, if we do so at all david i had a i had a question thanks dave i appreciate that your thoughts hmm. sure dave i had a question about um the mounding and the water quality so I'm assuming the mounding, if it was happening in real time, there would be quite a storm going on. And my understanding of those proprietary systems is during those storms, they just flush through. So that infiltration system would be some part of water quality during these events, these large events. Is is that also your understanding? I mean, they don't work if water is just surcharging through there. They only work if it's, you know, slow and, and methodical kind of action. Yeah, I mean, that, yes. Yeah. So I think you short circuiting the basin. If it's not recharging, yes, there's less water quality, um, you know, improvement flowing through that system. Um, but at the same time, it's is that needed water quality because they've met their CSS requirements through the proprietary separators. We're not. Mm. There's the additional polishing that you would get with the recharge and, and the filtration that you get from the soils. Um, but I, I think that's above and beyond what's required by the state regulations if they're meeting their 80% TSS. Through proprietary separators before that water reaches 
the infiltration chamber. Or if it's coming directly from a roof, it's considered clean. And, it, you know, the infiltration is just polishing it. Yeah, so they one is, with the, there's one system, maybe it's both, but there's one that combines roof with uh, road surface or parking area. So there's there's that system. So um, I, I I wanted to ask a question. That's that's all. I I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, according to the well, regs, they met the can direct our um, our peer reviewers to investigate. You know that question. You know if 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 there is mounding back into the system, what are the implications on the system's ability to meet the the uh, the stormwater standards? Yeah, we, we can look into that. Um, part of my concern about mounding has always been for, for the largest infiltration devices that um, a, a regional rise in the groundwater table um, that that spreads laterally um, uh, could impact the, the underground parking and the setbacks that are supposed to be provided relative to that basin. So um, we can we yeah, expand I, well, that I, I to focus on the water quality side too. Yeah, I think I think the applicant has sort of addressed that with the waterproofing. I feel like. Or... Okay. So we have I have two requests. That's that's what I came up. This one about we were just talking about uh, to investigate the mounting uh, back into the system to make sure that we maintain the water uh, we maintain the water quality um, of that unit, and then we have install or monitor the existing wells if they're in the correct location and then compare them to the index wells for the spring. And then whatever the results come from those, uh, from those wells that you'll take the most conservative, uh, the conservative set of uh, numbers to design the system. So it's either gonna be the existing four or something different. Chuck, sorry, we also, I'm sorry, we, we also had the um, the reasoning, the justification from VSC of why they use less than 24 hour storm for the mounding analysis. Is that correct? That was one of them, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, Chuck, sorry, you were just saying using existing wells. We should double, we should, Don probably knows, are any of the existing wells that are set up for monitoring, are they located within the footprint of the proposed infiltration basin, you know, around the test pit area, test pit seven, test pit eight area? Or or how about even this? You, you're not saying that you were even there to see the wells go in place. Are you confident with those wells? You know, how they were no, installed? Sorry. Hold on, sorry. Can I just get clarification on that? Point because someone was the neighbor was talking about existing monitoring wells having put in been put in several yeah you know, last last year I just want to know are those at, are any of those located within the footprint of the infiltration basin if Dom knows or if any of yet or Scott might know either too. Do you want sorry this chair I was waiting for you to want me to answer that question sure uh okay. Dominic, please yeah i i'm actually scrolling through my stuff to figure out if it's in test pit seven or eight but it's one of them okay so we do have an existing well that could be monitored then chuck that's that's what i was getting at because the way you were phrasing it it sounded like we were asking them to do monitoring of the groundwater at you know at wells that were not where the infiltration basin is, and that was not my original intent with my thought. So there's the large infiltration chamber, and then there's the I don't know if it's three monitoring wells along Dorothy that have to do with the townhouses. So I thought we were talking about monitoring all of those systems, but if it's only the large one, and if it's only um, if we're only talking about uh, test pit number seven and that large infiltration area, then then it would just be one. So what's what does the commission want? That one well or? Let, 
that that seems to be that that's my focus at this point. I don't mean I'm not speaking for the other commissioners, obviously, but that's my point. It seems like you know we we need confirmation that we have the two feet of separation in this sort of critical piece of stormwater infrastructure that's going to provide a lot of uh, benefit, you know, to the resource area. So I, I think my focus is on confirming that we have two feet of separation in the in the area of test pit seven where the existing well is. But I think we have, based on the test pits that have been done so far and the modeling and the characteristics of the site that have been observed, the groundwater that, that was observed at the time of the test pits under a normal year, plus the modeling that was observed in all the other sites, I think we have a good understanding of what the water table is and what it's doing in that area. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the functionality of this um, infiltration of the chamber. I, I, I'm with Dave. Okay. I don't know where, well, where, where others feel about that, Susan or Brian. Same. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, in agreement. Any, any other comments? I'd like it over the, inf the large infiltrations chamber. Great. So we have uh, three requests, right? And I'm going to ask Susan to go through those three requests because I know you wrote them down uh, and we want to get them right. So let's uh, let's just say the, the request one time. Can you do that for us, Susan? I have notes. Um... Sure. Um, so the first request is we'd like the information from the applicant um, about why less than 24 hours was used for the duration for the mounding analysis. That was number one. Yeah. Um, we would like um, the applicant to perform um, monitoring of the well or wells, if there's more than one, because we know there's at least one, over the large infiltration unit um, near test pit seven or eight. Um, and we'd like that monitoring to begin in March of this year. And we'd like the monitoring data for, um, don't think we said how many months. I would I would suggest two or three. I, I don't know what the standard is. Let's let me see if I can find the standard. But okay, go to the, go to the third one. It says okay. through the spring and then compare it to the index wells. That was the other step that we were going to do. Right, and compare it to the index wells. Okay. And I don't know that we, there wasn't. Was there another one? And then you wanted then okay. you had that uh, condition about using the most conservative numbers. Right, for, um, yes. And then David and I talked about mounding uh, and uh, making sure that uh, when the mounding happens and it backs up into the system, that it maintains, um, or at least this is for our peer reviewer, to review that and to make sure that um, the water quality stays uh, consistent. I don't know if, David, you want to, yeah, it's just the um, the implications on maintaining the um, stormwater standards if you know if and when that occurs. You know, if they're relying on it for water quality, are there implications on water quality? If they're relying on it for recharge, what are the implications on on recharge? Um, you know, related to the standard. Okay, all right. So that's it. Uh, we spent a long time on this tonight. I'm going to ask to have a continuance. Yeah, Chuck, one more thing. Uh, we at the beginning, uh, Dom was going to provide and just double check what the number, what the elevation of the re redox feature he observed first observed in test pit seven, and then also remember they are going to uh, BSC is going to respond. BSC is going to respond to uh, Hatch's latest letter from today. Yeah, if, uh, if mm -hmm. Also Sorry about that. Just trying to look up the date, but uh, the date of our next meeting was what I was looking for. So we do have two March additional. March 7th. March 7th. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a list of requests. March 7th is our next meeting. Dominic. Is that um, 
will that work for for you to come back to the commission with some information, understanding that the monitoring is going to be longer than that? Could I just make a request just because there was a lot there and a lot of people were talking into what those requests were that we get something in writing so we can certainly uh we're all on the same page as to what we're uh absolutely giving you and then um yeah i mean let's go with it's march 7th i think you said yeah uh, so sure and then if uh you need more time we can always continue at that point so um our seventh so I'm asking for uh, a motion to continue this hearing until March 7th. Motion to continue to March 7th. Okay. have a second? I'll second. Sure. Uh, Susan Chapnick? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. Brian McBride? Yes. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. Chuck Taroni says yes, and I did forget somebody, I think. I did say Brian McBride, right? Okay. You so didn't have... forget anybody because um, David oh, was yeah. accused. Oh, that's right, yeah. David's out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're continuing to uh, March 7th, and um, that's great. So I'll see uh, everybody, and thank you for showing up tonight. And Chuck, we can get that letter out tomorrow? Yeah, I think that we're going to have to make sure we have uh, exactly what was asked. Uh, so Ryan, again, circulated to myself and vice chair, yep. and we'll make sure that the requests are in, and uh, we'll, then we'll send it to Dominic and Ross, both teams. Okay. There's nothing else on our agenda, anything the commission wants to talk about? If not, I'll take a motion to close. Motion to, close. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Sure. Second. Sure. And I, I think it's fine. So I'll just go through the, I can go through again or everyone can wave, whatever you want to do. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Shapnick. Yes. I don't know if David White's back on, maybe not. Um, David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you.